Okay. No, clerk, I'm ready. Case number 2027 Catch strong on behalf of the state. William J. for the state. Defense. James Owens for Sarah Bull. Tony Newsom for Sarah Bull. Kevin Beck on behalf of Sarah Ms. Bull, please. Please I do. Ma'am, good morning. Can you please state your full name and date of birth for the record for me? Sarah Boone, 101077. Ms. Boone is seated at council's table wearing a light gray suit and a white blouse. She is in custody, however, will not be wearing any restraints. As such, we will continue to stand when our jury enters and exits. We're here for a charging conference. The court has reviewed, I believe, both parties' red lines as to the jury instructions, including, I believe, that was submitted last night, the defense's red line as to the jury instructions that were provided by the court. Let's try to get as much done as we can until our jury arrives. I believe what we had discussed yesterday was starting at the beginning and moving through as quickly as possible until we get to the real meat of some of the issues in the 3.6F and the 3.6G instructions. Mr. J? Uh, may I remain seated during the charge? Yes, sir, you may. Thank you. All right. Um, I have in my hand a 34-page document that was emailed to the court last night by counsel for the defense. Um, at 12.15, uh, 12.06 a.m. from Lauren Henderson, that's what the court's going to be relying on. Does everyone have that in front of them? Yes, sir. Defense. And paces, yes, Judge. Okay, all right, let's start on page one of 34, 3.1, introduction to final instructions. Any objection to the form of this instruction state? Um, now I'm confused. I don't know that I have a 34 page document from them last night. There was an attachment. There was an email 1206. Hang on. Let me make sure. 36F, separate red lines, 36G, separate red lines, 8.9, culpable negligence, red lines, separate. Give me a moment. Then it was what was sent at 1131 yesterday. That 34 page document. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> No, thirty one. I don't know if it's thirty four. It says thirty one to me. I have it as thirty four. Excuse me, Judge. Yes, sir. Can I have Ms. Henderson explain how she said the document? Fine by me. Your Honor, I, uh, Mr. Good morning, 1130. I sent uh, the instructions from the defense based off the document that sent to us yesterday morning. Um, and then last night we approached. And I had asked if that format was okay for you. I believe Mr. J had said that the defense sent separate 3.6, 3.9. So it would be easy to incorporate in the final instruction. And that's what was sent at 12.05 last night. All right. Just for more convenience for you. Understood. Okay. But the balance of the instructions, because that just addresses those. The, the, what you just uh, advised only speaks to the 3.6, 3.6G instructions. Correct. Okay. All right. So I'm talking about the balance of the instructions that may or may not be at issue. Yes, sir. That was the balance of instructions that are not at issue. Those are what the instructions are. Okay. All right. My confusion is. Court is indicating they have a 34 page document. Yes, sir. I have a 31 page document to us by Ms. Henderson. 
Are you looking at October 24 at 1131 a.m.? Subject, defense proposed jury instructions in red line format. I'm sorry. No worries. Um, I'm looking at the email correspondence of October 24, 2024, 1131 a.m. Subject, defense proposed jury instructions in red line format. Is it possible that you don't have your track or track changes are off? And maybe that's why that's the difference. Uh, in Word, under review, or I can just have Madam Clerk print out two more copies. So we can just work our way through that. Quick track changes for everyone is still only 31 pages. Okay. I'm going to, I just forward it to Madam Clerk. I'm going to have her print out two copies. That way we've got hard copies. So we seem to be all on the same page.
Both parties have what was provided to the court yesterday, a 34 page document, which includes the defense's red line with regard to the proposed jury instructions. We'll start on page one of 34, instruction 3.1, introduction to final instructions. Any objection to the form of this instruction state? No, Your Honor. Defense? No, Your Honor. Moving to page thir two of 34, instruction 3.2, statement of the charge state? No objection. Defense? No objection. Moving to page three of 34, 7.1, introduction to homicide. Those three paragraphs, any objection? No objection. No objection. Moving to the next portion, justifiable homicide in the singular paragraph. Any objection, state? No objection. Defense? No objection. Moving to excusable homicide in the four paragraphs, including paragraphs numbered one, two, and three, state? No objection. I have no objection to anything I said. Okay, thank you. Defense? No objection. Moving to page 434, 7.4, second degree murder instruction. Defense, any objection to the no. form of the instruction? No objection. And also the removal of the lesser included chart on page 5 of 34, correct? Correct. Moving to page 6 of 34, instruction 3.4, when there are lesser included crimes or attempts. My only question is, if I understand from the defense, they're looking to see culpable negligence as a lesser included. Yes. Would that not need to be included here? Yes. Okay. So is the only addition uh, to this, the balance of the 3.4 instruction would be correct with the exception of the last sentence, which would read the lesser crimes, correct. plural, indicated in the definition of second degree murder is manslaughter and followed by culpable negligence. Yes. So is she going to harm? Yes. State. State objects. There's no evidence to support a misdemeanor culpable negligence lesser included defense for a category two lesser to be included in the jury instructions. Both must be supported by the charging instrument as well as uh, the evidence in the case. Um, there is no evidence in this case that he only suffered culpable negligence. Um, the crime for culpable negligence with death is manslaughter. Um, culpable negligence isn't even a category one lesser of manslaughter, it's a category two lesser, which includes the by inference, there must be some evidence that her culpable negligence did not result in death. What's your response to that? Judge, the instruction that we're asking for is um, 8.9. It reads to prove the crime of culpable negligence. The state must prove the following two elements beyond a reasonable doubt. One, Sarah Boone exposed George Torres Jr. to personal injury. And two, she did so through culpable negligence. Uh, as to the fact that um, there's evidence, there is evidence of culpable negligence as to the case and the fact that uh, Ms. Boone, uh, while uh, Mr. Torres is still in the suitcase, goes upstairs. Uh, as to it being charged, it's a category two lesser included that is, that's available to the defense. The defense can get category two lesser included offenses as long as there's evidence to support the category two 
And there is evidence in this case to support the capital to less than two. Any other further argument, Mr. J? Okay, all right. At this point in time, the court is inclined to include the culpable negligence as the lesser included. We'll get to the instruction momentarily. Any other revisions to the 3.4 instruction defense? No, you are. Moving now to 7.7 .7 manslaughter. There are some objections. The defense is now objecting to paragraph 2C, the death of George Torres was caused by the culpable negligence of Sarah Boone. So how can you ask for a culpable negligence instruction and then object to 2C in the manslaughter instruction? I'm logically having trouble understanding that. I, and just as, this is my argument, because I'm not arguing that there is an evidence of it, because I just said that it's a uh, the, the difference is, and I think the burden is different from the state, because it's not alleged in their information. Does not the instruction say give 2A, 2B, and or 2C, depending upon allegations and proof? Yes, the allegations would be the information. Okay. Any response, Mr. J? Judge, uh, it's category one, lesser. Um, all the theories are included in that language, do not, would not be included in the charging instrument. And quite frankly, it's not inconsistent with the language in the charging instrument. She's accused of having a depraved mind when killing him. And what the evidence has also shown is that she was uh, heavily intoxicated uh, when she made this decision. Um, that supports the conclusion for a charge of fact to reach that this was out of culpable negligence. And if they reject our um, argument that it was done knowingly and not Patriots, ill will spite, etc. Any other argument, sir? No other argument. At this point in time, the court is going to overrule the defense's objection as to the objection to 2C and the manslaughter instruction, including the final two paragraphs of what the definition of culpable negligence is on the bottom of page 7 of 34. It seems like it's stipulated between the parties that 2B, Sarah Boone intentionally procured an act that caused the death of George, of, uh, George Boone, should be George Torres, is not applicable. Is that correct, State? Is that correct, defense? Okay, thank you. Um, and also, since 2B is not applicable, the to procure definition will not be provided. Any other questions regarding the 7.7 .7 instruction? No, no, Your Honor. No objection to what they suggest is the uh, definition of culpable negligence. With regard to the second lesser? The second lesser? Yeah, thank you. No objection to that. All right, very good. Thank you very much. Um, what is the uh, instruction number for the uh, culpable negligence instruction? I think it's 8.9, isn't it? Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> Moving now to page 10 of 34, 3.6D, voluntary intoxication. Does this now need to address culpable negligence? Or is that only... Yeah, we would request uh, to add it. Culpable negligence is before you get it. So it should read second degree murder, common manslaughter, comma, or culpable negligence. You're talking in the, the last sentence, correct? Voluntary intoxication is not a defense to second degree murder, manslaughter, or culpable negligence. Yes, Thank you. Any objection? Defense. No, I Thank you. Do we want to take an attempt to address the 3.6F? I would suggest we do that later and see if we can okay. at, this, at this time, I'm just going to make a note that we're going to bypass the 3.6 F instruction and 3.6 G instruction. That'll take us all the way to page 23 of 34, instruction 3.7, <clears throat> plea of not guilty, reasonable doubt, and burden of proof. Any objection to the form of this instruction defense? No objection. Moving now to page 24 of 34. 
weighing the evidence 3.9 instruction. Should we go to 3.7 be Did I skip it? Yes, page 134. I'm sorry, I thought that's what we just covered, Mr. J. I apologize. No, I didn't. I was just making sure uh, that there were no edits that either the court made or the defense made. So I was scrolling, um, but no objection. Okay, thank you. Moving now to page 2434, 3.9, weighing the evidence. Looks like give as applicable paragraphs six, seven, nine, and ten have been struck. Is that acceptable state? Yes, Your Honor. I agree that uh, eight, the inconsistent statement instruction should get bumped up to six. Agreed. The remainder should not be read. With those um, revisions, is that is that instruction three point nine acceptable to the defense? Yes, Your Honor. Moving now to page twenty five of thirty four, the. Uh, latter portion of the 3.9 instruction. Any objection to the language contained on this page state? No, sir. Defense? No, you're wrong. Moving now, the 3.9A instruction was struck by virtue of Ms. Boone testifying in this matter, so that need not be addressed. The 3.9B defendant statement instruction also included the requested language by the state. Is there any objection to the form of this instruction at this time, defense? No, you're right. Okay, Ms. Boone, earlier this week, and I can't recall if it was yesterday or the day before, the state had filed a motion seeking to add additional language to this instruction. And I had read that language to you at that time. Do you want me to read it again to you this morning? Okay, so I'm going to read you the entire 3.9B instruction. 3.9b defendant statements reads, a statement claimed to have been made by the defendant outside of court has been placed before you. Such a statement should always be considered with caution and be weighed with great care to make certain it was freely and voluntarily made. Therefore, you must determine from the evidence that the defendant's alleged statement was knowingly, voluntarily, and freely made. In making this determination, you should consider the total circumstances, including, but not limited to, one, whether when the defendant made the statement, she had been threatened in order to get her to make it, and two, whether anyone had promised her anything in order to get him to make it. That should be revised to the feminine. Any objection? No, Defense? No, you That is the form instruction created by the Florida Supreme Court, ma'am. What has been added is the next paragraph, which reads, law enforcement is not legally required to ask a suspect whether he or she wants to talk to law enforcement after Miranda warnings are read to a suspect. This is, however, one of the factors you may consider whether the defendant's statements were voluntarily made. Similar to other conversations we've had this past week, ma'am, I don't want to know about specifics of any conversations that you had with you and your attorneys, just simply whether or not those conversations have been had. Did you and your lawyers discuss the proposed language that I just read to you? Yes. Do you have any questions with regard to that proposed language? No. Are you in agreement with this um, additional language being added to this defense? All right, thank you, or to this instruction, rather. Thank you. The last sentence read, if you conclude the defendant's out-of-court statements, statement, excuse me, was not freely and voluntarily made, you should disregard it. Any other clarifications um, to that instruction statement? No, Your Honor, thank you. Defense? Judge, and looking at it, it says in the final court, consider whether the defendant's statements uh, can we replace and put whether Sarah Boone's statements. Where are we specifically, sir? In the state special that I have no objection to, it says, this is however one of the factors you may consider whether the defendant's statement, if we could have Sarah Boone's statement, or voluntary. The language used all throughout the instruction is the defendant. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with the state on that. Okay. Rule 3.10, or I'm sorry, instruction 3.10, rules for deliberation, page 28 of 34. 
looks like the parties agree that paragraph seven is not applicable. Yes, I agree. Uh, that would change uh, paragraph eight to seven. Any other revisions to 3.10? Defense? Moving to 3.11, cautionary instruction. Defense? No objection. The court then interlineated on page 30, the 2.7 closing argument form instruction. Any objection to that instruction state? No. Defense? No, Your Honor. Moving now to 3.12 verdict instruction, page 31 of 34, state? Okay. Defense? No objection. Moving now to 32 of 34, instruction 3.13, submitting case to jury. Um, the only other question I have for the parties is with regard to, I believe it was exhibit A, um, the suitcase. Are we going to send that back or is that going to be viewable upon writing similar to the baseball bat? No reason to Okay. Agreed? Agreed. Okay. All right. Um, is this instruction acceptable to the state? Yes, sir. Defense? Yes, Your Honor. Very good. And then moving to that concludes the um, except for the 3.6 F and 3.6 G instruction that includes the verdict or the uh, instructions. I'll have a need to clean that up and send it to the parties so that we have a cleaner red line to work with. The only other question that I think we can address this morning is the verdict form. Um, I received the defense's verdict form, and it looks like manslaughter is no longer being sought in the verdict form. Manslaughter was struck out, and it was just culpable negligence. Under the defense of the prosecutor. Right. Yeah. Okay. So how do we want to address the verdict form then? Because if we're giving instructions on manslaughter, it certainly needs to be included in the verdict form. I understand, Judge, but the defense isn't requesting manslaughter. But if it's instructed, it has to be so the verdict form would read, we, the jury, find the defendant guilty of murder in the second degree as charged in the information. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of the lesser included offense of manslaughter. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of the lesser included offense of culpable negligence. We, the jury, find the defendant not guilty. Is that acceptable to the state? Is that acceptable to the defense? Yes. All right. Similarly, I'll have Ms. Berrios make those revisions and submit them to the parties as soon as possible. Anything else state we need to address before? I mean, Bruce, do we have everybody as of this time? Everybody's here. Thank you, sir. Um, other than the 3.6 instructions and the state's request for other instructions, which I think we'll have to table for now. Yes. Sir. Are we prepared to go ahead and bring in our jury at this time? Only thing I wanted to bring to the court and, uh, and she was apparently yesterday at launch there was some sort of domestic violence event out in the quad. Um, a coworker indicated that um, without believing it was any particular jurors in this case, that he did, did see four juror badges in and out the area. So I don't know if that warrants a free life. Defense? I think it should be mentioned. I agree. Okay. I agree. Um, just to see. Sure. We spent the, all this time, we've got a bunch of alternates. Was you like? Issue. Yes, what do we got? I think the state attorney, the last piece of evidence is they, uh, they extracted from Sarah Lee's home a bunch of pages of uh, text messages. And I believe their intent is to introduce all of those text messages, which are quite a few, but I think they want to read specifically out a few to the jury. My only concern is I don't know which ones they're going to read out. And, and under the rule of completeness, if there's a thread, uh, where it needs to be put in context, we would ask that all of that be read. So I don't know exactly what they're going to do. Mr. J, any response? It's going back with them, uh, just like I told them during some of the body worn cameras. Um, only some of it's published, it's all going to be there for them to use. Um, I do not intend on reading um, all 108 pages. I don't intend on trying to delineate what contextually. One conversation from the other. Uh, I think it's just fair to say this is all going back with you. You're going to scrub laptop. You can do it all. Okay. Mr. Owens, you can make any objections you deem necessary at the time, and we'll address it. 
because it's just hard for me to, to say what what should or should not be. I understand the state's position, but if it's something that's um, you believe in the rule of completeness should be provided at that time, regardless of it going back, we'll address it. It's going to be about 40 minutes with the reading text messages. Are we going to have some people come in to read the messages? Uh, again, I'm not sure how long it's going to take. I did not practice reading what uh, I'm going to be reading in the mirror. Number two, no. Uh, I don't understand why the witness can be called. It's in evidence of uh, the lawyers now published. Anything further, Mr. Rollins? Okay, all right. Not on that issue, I would like to take like five minutes to use the bathroom. Sure, we can do that. Okay, so um, I don't want to highlight that it was a domestic violence event. So are the parties, uh, is it acceptable to the parties to inquire of if anyone heard or participated, got any information or uh, observed anything of the event that transpired yesterday afternoon in the courtyard? Is that acceptable? Yeah, I definitely should suggest for uh, Agreed. Okay, got a thumbs up for Mr. Owens. All right, we'll take a, uh, a 10 minute recess. We'll just plan on bringing back here at 9.30. We'll bring the jury in at that time. Thank you all very much. You all can be seated, thank you. All right, we're back on the record. Case number 2020 CF 2603, State of Florida versus Sarah Boone. Let me get appearances for counsel, starting with counsel for the state. Dave Gastro on behalf of the state. William J. for the state. James Owens for Sarah Boone. Tony Henderson for Sarah Boone. Uh, Ms. Boone is still seated at counsel's table. Are we ready to go ahead and bring in our jury at this time? State. Yes, sir. Defense. Yes, sir. All right, let's stand and bring in our jury. State, do you recognize our jury? Yes, Your Honor. Defense, do you recognize our jury? Yes. All right, members of the jury, you can be seated. Members of the jury, good morning. Welcome back to 12 Alpha of the Orange County Courthouse. Uh, just again, if you could raise those hands, confirm you complied with the court's instructions. All, right, all hands have been raised. Thank you very much. Our members of the jury, before the state continues with their evidence presentation today, I just have a couple of questions to go over with you. Yesterday, there was an event in the courtyard of the uh, Orange County Courthouse. Did anyone happen to observe that event? If you did, please raise your hands at this time. What do you mean by observed? We'll get to it. Okay. okay. Did anyone happen to hear anything during that event? Our record reflects no hands have been raised. Did anyone see anything during that event? All right. Juror number two, first row. Thank you, ma'am. Did anyone participate in that event? I could reflect no hands have been raised. Did anyone receive any writings or review any material from that event? I could reflect no one has raised their hands. Can the parties approach for a moment?
All right. Uh, members of the jury, I'm going to send everyone out except for juror number two in the first row. Uh, we've got a couple follow-up questions for you individually, ma'am. Same instruction I've given you all previously. Please don't conduct any independent investigation or research as to the person, places, things, or charge involved. And don't have any discussions amongst yourselves or anyone else. And we'll bring you back in as promptly as possible. Thank you. You all may be seated. Thank you. Juror in seat two on the first row from right to left. Um, you uh, had advised based on the court's question that you had observed something and you said, what is observed means? And instead of uh, getting that out in front of every other juror, we just want to have that individual conversation with you now. So tell me what it is that you saw or heard or anything yesterday in the, in the courtyard yesterday. When I was we were walking back from lunch and they, we saw that they were gathered and I asked the deputy if he knew what was going on. And he said it was the, somebody being talking about domestic violence. Okay. And you said we were walking. Who's we? Um, another juror. I don't want to say your name. Okay. All right. Um, do, is that a juror that was on our panel here? Yes. Okay. All right. Do you recall where they may have been seated? Uh, no. In the back over there. Okay. All right. Do you recall uh, color her hair was? Yes. What? No, you Please. Dark brown or black? Is it the shorter juror? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. State any further questions. And after um, you were told what was going on, then what happened? I walked back in. All right. Did you hear any of the speakers? I didn't or? hear anything. Anything further from the defense? Now, did that affect your ability to be fair and impartial? Can the parties approach for a moment? We appreciate you, ma'am. Thank you so much. We're going to go ahead and bring in the balance of the panel. You can just hang out where you're at, okay? We stand for you. You do not need to stand. We stand for you. State, you recognize our jury. Yes, Your Honor. Defense, you recognize our jury. Yes. All right, y'all can be seated. Thank you. Again, members of the jury, if I can see those hands, you complied with the instructions during that really short break. Record reflect all hands in the raise. Thank you very much. Mr. Jay, you may proceed, sir. Permission to publish from States 21, which was previously marked as P for identification. You may proceed, sir. Again, this is a DVD exhibit with two folders in the main directory. One entry is in a a folder called attachments. Another is a PDF labeled extraction. And for the record, it is 108 pages and the entire document will go back uh, to the jury and there will be a laptop provided to them uh, to utilize this exhibit. For purposes of publication, I'm going to go by 
age number and date, unless something requires more specificity. And for to and from, I'm going to just use the name of the contact if one exists or the phone number if one doesn't. On page one, creation time for notes, 749, asking Jorge or George not to be uh, despicable to me, making more drink after he guzzled his and I shared mine. On page two, date uh, March 8th, 2018. You are now in a rela relationship with Jorge or George on Facebook. Um, meta and metadata entry 100014, et cetera, for Jorge Torres to um, Sarah Boone owner. Page three, May 21st, 2019, from 407 716 8684 to Melissa. And he can still live here, correct? Or until I decide to finally get him out if he doesn't change, clean up his act after tomorrow. On page nine, May 30th, 2019, from a contact labeled as mom, paren, Jorge, or George, to 407-716-8684, uh, which I will just refer to as owner um, in future references. Where is my clippers in the gray box? From owner to mom, Jorge, all capitals, dumpster, separate message, like you, separate message, so is your two shirts, separate message, no more Rick and Morty, a response from contact mom Jorge to owner, okay, okay, from owner to mom Jorge, Lucas cried when he saw the adventure fund was gone, thank you, no wonder you're out, fuck off. From owner, he's the one that broke it because you took it. From owner, wanted to go on an adventure. On to page 10. From owner, be proud, feel good. He made my, quote unquote, our son cry. Cheese stick, Lucas, your kids, get the fuck out of my life and my sons. No one, no one, no one. Spinster, good, for, nothing. Dumpster diver, that's what you are and the rest of you. Later on on the same page, owner to mom, Jorge, get all of you. Mean, selfish, fuck all you. Your first barn is a joke. Going on to page 11, same date of May 30th, 2019, from owner to mom, Jorge, get the fuck out of my life. Lucas two, bad influence. From Jorge to owner, I am, as you can see, go drink your life away. From owner to mom, Jorge, your kids are too. Yuck. Shucks, I only have one. Beaters, your three together. Yuck. Going on to page 12 from owner to mom, Jorge. Still dated 5 30, 2019. Gross. And all the time, gross. Mom, Jorge to owner. I love that guy. I love that guy. You're the one who kicked me out. Owner to Jorge, mom. Finally. Get your shot together and check me out in two to three months. Hope you're there. Unless I find someone better. Shit. Together. 
from mom Jorge to owner. Are you serious? Are you serious? Owner to mom Jorge, that's what happens? No. Mom Jorge to owner, I'm helping out dad right now. Call you in a few. Owner to mom Jorge, can you help me put out? Fuck off. Jorge, mom to owner. How? No problem. From 267 216 5170 to owner. Damn, you, you can only talk when you're drunk and talking shit. Owner to the previously mentioned 267 number. Stop calling, texting my phone. He's not here anymore. And it's damn. 267 number to owner. NP, you didn't have to be a bitch about it. Owner to 267. Going on to page 13. Still May 30th, 2019. Yo, I like you all. He's a dick and the sheriff just left. Sorry, I couldn't text back. I'll always respect you all. You know that he's not here anymore. And yes, I am a bitch. So are you. 267 to owner. Look, I'm not here to be taking shots at you. I never called you a bitch. I said you were acting like one. I'm not going to be here going back and forth on some childish shit. Have a good night. Owner to the 267 number. Friends forever. Thank you. Would love to chat sometime. Call his parents, I guess. Further down on page 13, now on to May 31st, 2019, from owner to mom, Jorge. Tell Jorge to call me. I want my things he took. I have his birth certificate and propane certificate. Until then, if he wants those back. And I have your quote unquote art box. Mom, Jorge to owner, stop being petty. I did not take anything that wasn't mine, I swear. Owner to mom, Jorge, you're a liar. I never can believe you from all the other lies. You stop being petty and take shit like you always do. Another one bites the dust, Jorge. Hope you're miserable like you've made everyone else. Mom, Jorge to owner, I'm not lying. Owner to mom, Jorge. Lucas said he won't miss you either. When I get mine back, you'll get yours. Mom, Jorge to owner, I didn't take it. I'm coming over in a few to get my stuff. And I'm coming with Jean and Melissa. Going on to page 14. Owner to mom, Jorge, go for it. Bring mine, W. Mom, Jorge to owner, I don't have anything of yours. That's why I'm coming with them so they can... Very, very that. Owner to mom, Jorge, I don't care. They're not going to babysit you because you're an asshole and got kicked out after being taken off the lease. Mom, Jorge, to owner, they seen what I had in my hands. Owner to mom, Jorge, still don't care or believe you. I'm going to get Lucas anyway, so don't waste their time or mine. Mom, Jorge, to owner, exactly. Owner to mom, Jorge, you were a visitor and a terrible resident, boyfriend too. Just go away unless you bring my stuff. Mom, Jorge to owner, I don't have your shit, Sarah. I need my birth certificate. Owner to mom, Jorge, I don't give a shit either. I worked for that birth certificate, voter's registration, and your ID card. Just because your name is on them doesn't make them yours. Even paid for them. I needed you to be a man and take care of me, not beat me, call me names and make me feel like I'm not a person, not giving back until I have mine. Mom Jorge to owner, whatever, Sarah. Owner to mom Jorge. Next step is restraining order. Know that you can come over here a hundred times. Doesn't mean I have to open the door. Good one, Jorge, go away. Mom Jorge to owner, whatever. Owner to mom, Jorge, it's been a great day without you. Will be from now on. Mom, Jorge to owner, you 
need to do. Owner to mom, Jorge, enjoy living with your parents at 41 with no girlfriend and lonely. It was the inevitable, just like it has been before. Owner to Jorge, mom, did you take Lucas's sunglasses? Mom, Jorge to owner, OMFG, no, I did not. Turning to June 2nd, page 15, 1.10.57 a.m. From owner to mom, Jorge. Jorge, question mark, call me. If Jorge is with you, can you have him call me, please? Text to Mo. One eighteen, sixteen seconds on June second. Owner to mom Jorge, I beat you to the punch. One do the dartboard with me. Come. Owner to Mo, I know you won't answer Mo. Tell him to come finish the dartboard with me, please. <clears throat> Owner to Mo, I miss him. Owner to mom Jorge. Ask Jorge to call me, please, when he gets a minute. June 2nd, 743, 40 a.m. Can you have Jorge call me, please, when he gets a chance if he's with you? 745 a.m. Owner to Mo. Going on to page 16, June 2nd, 2019, 1050 a.m. 55 seconds. Owner to Mo. Uh, hello. Can you please have Jorge call me? Willing to give back. Don't know if he's there or at parents. Really want to see him. Owner to mom Jorge at 10.52, 16 a.m. Not pursuing after 12 o'clock ever again. Twelve nineteen p.m., 23 seconds. Owner to mom Jorge, please call. Come over. I'll come get you. Come over, please. I need a super hug. Hugs, please need you. 6.23 PM, owner to Anna. He doesn't live here anymore. Call parents or Mo in response to an incoming phone call that was made at 6.10 PM, 54 seconds from Anna to owner. Entries 9803-9804 in the PDF timeline, June 2nd, 2019. Image 0092.heic, capture time 6.3301 p.m. Image 0093-heic, captured 6.3326 p.m. Publishing from attachments. Image underscore zero zero nine two metadata uh, showing six two two thousand nineteen six thirty three p.m. And image or IMG underscore 0093 metadata date taken 6 to 2019, 633 p.m. 6.34 p.m., 51 seconds, June 2nd, 2019. Outgoing from owner to mom, Jorge. All up to you now, big boy. And for the record, uh, those images were sent to mom, Jorge, at 6.34 p.m., 33 seconds. Look what you made me do. Or maybe your mom will for you. Response from mom, Jorge, to owner. Wow, that's really childish. 
owner to mom, Jorge, but effective. Mom, Jorge to owner. Yeah, I see what you're doing. Did Lucas leave? Owner to mom, Jorge. I'm watching shadows be gone for good. Minus birth certificate. Mom, Jorge to owner. Okay, cool. Enjoy. Owner to mom, Jorge. Am. Nice. You're not. And nice was from mom, Jorge to uh, owner. Going on to page 17. This is still June 2nd, 2019. Mom, Jorge to owner. Yes, I am. You are not, though. Owner to mom, Jorge. To who? Your mom? Brothers? Not me. Mom, Jorge to owner. To everyone. Owner to mom, Jorge, but me. Mom, Jorge to owner. I love you. Owner to mom, Jorge. I'm going out at eight. Get dressed. I've given you since noon. Peace out, Boy Scout. Mom, Jorge to owner. I'm coming over with a handle. I was helping pop all day, cut grass. Owner to mom, Jorge. Yay, you. Getting in the shower, then out. Bye bye. Mom, Jorge to owner. Excuse me, can we approach the bench? Yes. Discussion's overruled. <clears throat> I'm already showered and dressed. Mom, Jorge to owner. Hello? Text from Anna to owner. You're rude as hell, but okay. Owner to Anna. Your dad is a POS, but okay. At least you know and will stop calling owner to Anna. Futile. Anna, to owner, CTFU as you are a piece of shit, but that's God's business, not mine. Have a good day, Coke whore. Since you like to switch it up, I'll do the same. Don't text me back either, fake ass. Page 20 of 108, June 9th, 2019, from owner to Philip. He's off the lease. The process has begun. Page 22, June 11th, 2019. Metadata only shows to mom, Jorge. You tell your son he's not welcome here, taken off the lease and bound, worthless. Don't show his ugly fucked up face around here again. Police will be called. Ask him if it was worth it and ride my bike he has. Stay Hispanic, that's what you all are. And he can watch all the porn he wants from the phone mom gave him. Page 26, June 14th, 2019, 11.38, 56 p.m. To mom, Jorge. Wow, congrats, blackouts and whoring. We wanted to see him, hot house, seven people, 
Mission to work on my bike. Repeat. Candy crush. Fuck himself. Shit job. Repeat. Same page, June 15th, 2019, 7.37 p.m., 48 seconds, to Melissa. Just an FYI, if my place gets effed up, I'm letting you know. He's in jail. Thanks for the prompts. I'm at my ex's house. Please don't let this reflect on me as a tenant. You said to call cops. I did. He's gone. We're both proud now. I consider you my friend. Melissa, why was he in your apartment? Page 38, notes, creation time, June 26, 2019, 5.56.57 a.m. 6.14, X videos, 10.03 a.m. Sarah Banks, 5.3 Banks, 6.13, Metro Activation, 6.12, skipping down, X videos, 6 2, 6 13 p.m. X video 6 1, X videos 5 31, 9 56 A. Who's Christine? Friend FB going to meet up? Question calling her beautiful? Question said she thought you were avoiding her when down here. Said no, I was not beautiful. FB dash nonchalant quay. Thanks for adding me. You are exquisite. Facebook messaging Camille 6 13. 942, Facebook, or FB, Pamela Erickson, sending pictures of yourself, telling her good morning, 714, 1213 AM. FB does Crystal, going to woo her, sweep her off her feet, going to change her mind. Luck is my middle name, sent her pics, kiss emojis, called her beautiful after returning to the convo, send, said you had to pick up your brother, sent pics of beer. Sent her struts, could have been me. Sent her songs, but not me. Messaged bunny kiss emojis, haunt convo. Sent puppy kiss emoji, would love to take her out and see a movie. Told her about what we do in the shadows. Would love to watch Creed 2 with her. Want to snuggle with her and eat popcorn. Sent heart hugging animal emoji. Want to play a board game with her. Asked to FaceTime, call her. Called her amazing messaging at 7.30 A, 6.14, 6.15, two days. FB dash Crystal liking all her posts, quote, losing someone who doesn't respect or appreciate you is actually a gain, not a loss. <clears throat> Can't compare me to the next girl because there is no competition. I'm one of a kind and that's real. Continuing on to page 39, same note. I found everything on your phone, all your messenger texts, telling Christine you want to meet up with her when she's here, calling her beautiful, thanking nonchalant Quay for adding you, and calling her exquisite, telling Pamela Anderson Erickson good morning and sending pictures at 12.38 a.m., messaging Camille, then the whole two-day convo with Crystal, how dare you, and send pictures wearing my wedding ring. You're a cheating, lying scumbag. I will never trust you. Why don't you put your mugshot up or I will, I will, since I have your phone and log in and tell everyone why you were in jail for the third time. Let them know you beat your wife and she put you there because she couldn't take it anymore. I want nothing to do with you ever again. I've become a different person since you've been gone with less stress, anxiety, and worry. I feel safe, comfortable, happier, 
with you not here or seeing you at all, I can say through, I do have heart, heartbreak after going through your phone. Thank you for always proving me right. I knew when you told me your mom gave you one that you'd be back to your slimy ways. You will never change. I hope it was all worth it, all of it, including taking losing my debit card for the third time to buy beer and cigarettes, which put you back where you belong. I know for a fact you were not worth any of it. I just can't believe after everything, everything I've done for you, including all I did to get you out of jail, and you do this to me. This is cheating. Goes on to page 40, goes on to page 41, and ends with never truly yours. Page 42. June 26th, 2019, 8.06 p.m., 16 seconds. Outgoing from owner to Mo. Just wanted to let you know to tell Jorge I found all his messages, kissy face heart emojis with Crystal and other bitches on FB, along with all his porn after he swore to me he wasn't doing any of that anymore. I'm not doing anything more for him and he will try and keep him in jail as long as I can. Cheating snake weasel, ask him, all about it or have your parents the next time they talk to him. I'm not anymore. So hurtful after all I've done for him, he can rot in there for all I care. Going on to page 43, to Mo from owner, and I will be there for the hearing next week and his arraignment on both charges. Peace out, fucks, AKA Torres. Same page 43 from owner to Mo, 626, 2019, 9:59:14 p.m. Begins. Hi, I was thinking if you could get out, I'd really love it if you'd take me to a movie, or we could snuggle like we do and watch Creed 2, get some popcorn and pretzels. Maybe talk about what kind of other movies we like or find a fun board game to play together. I know your favorite is Avalon. What do you think? I was also thinking the other day about how much I miss you sending me pictures of yourself throughout the day, sending me songs you wanted to hear or thought I'd like. But what I really miss are the kissy love emojis you would send just because I really miss those, especially the ones with hearts. They'd always make me smile. I knew you were thinking about me. You do Crystal, though, even asked her to FaceTime. What would you do if you found me having this convo with Ben or John or anyone other than you? I'd be beaten to a bloody pulp and don't do any of these things anymore. But yet you wear your wedding ring and mine around your neck and tell me how much you love me. But you're telling this woman who looks like TPT you want to snuggle with, take out to a movie, play board games with questions. Sending music, cutesy, kissy, love emojis to like you used to me. Telling her you want to woo her, sweep her off her feet. How do you think that makes me feel? How don't, why don't you say that to me? Going on. Through the rest of page 43, page 44 including on page 44, dirty cheat, enjoy your porn and jerking yourself off secretly so your parents don't see you and your ugly new girlfriends. I can't wait to finally be with a real man, Ben, who will and has taken care of me. Can't wait to see what he's like in bed. I already know he kisses. Hope it was all worth it. I'm free. As you told Crystal in your messenger text, you're single with a little cutesy dancing dinosaur. Wow. Now you really are, you're despicable. Next text is XOXO from Mo to owner. Page 50, 628, 2019, 
10.55.47 p.m. from owner to Mo. Just know, I can do so much more damage than all of you put together. Know that. Going on to page 51. Try me. Page 72, June, July 20th, 2019, 11, 11, 4 p.m. From Janice to owner, no metadata, but from Janice. Sorry it's so late, I just read your text. He seemed fine when I saw him at your apartment this morning. He answered the door right away, but was quite bummed out that he overslept, but I was okay and told him, no problem, just get ready and come in, come to work in about half an hour. Then I texted your phone and asked if he would rather work the afternoon shift and get some sleep, but he never answered, so I have no idea where he is or what he's doing. What la happened last night, he had a black eye. He said it was new because I asked him and I told him to put makeup on it. He said he had taken had that taken care of. Did you two get in it again? He acted like when I told him he had a black guy. At first, he didn't know what I was talking about. I guess he kind of blacked out. You can call me back if you want. Eleven thirty p.m. Thirty-eight seconds from owner to mom. Jorge Janice just called me looking for Jorge, and she's pissed. Congrats. Page 82, 821, August 21st, 2019, from Jorge to owner, I love you, my friend, my love, my queen, my everything. <clears throat> Now that concludes everything I'm going to publish to the jury on this exhibit. Okay. So we report to the yes. Members of the jury, thank you for your patience. I just have a short instruction to read to you. Members of the jury, the state showed you portions of what was entered into as State's Exhibit 21. It is not the entirety of State's Exhibit 21. The entirety of State's Exhibit 1 will go back to you into the deliberation room with a laptop for you to review all the exhibits and text messages uh, and the total conversations over and above what was highlighted by the state. With that state, do you have any other witnesses, evidence, or testimony to provide? Your Honor, at this time, the state rests its rebuttal case. Okay. Anything further from the defense? You want to approach? I just think we have some issues outside the presence of the jury. <clears throat> outside the presence of the jury. Okay. I have one thought, though, that requires Come on up. All right, members of the jury, 
We're going to go ahead and excuse you for a couple minutes. I got some things I have to discuss with counsel outside of your presence. Um, we'll bring you back in for additional instructions on where we think we're going to go after that. Similar instruction that I've given you over the last couple of days, please do not conduct any independent research or investigation with regards to the persons, places, things, or charge involved in this case. And do not have any discussions among yourselves or anyone else about them. We'll bring you back in as promptly as possible. Thank you. Y'all can be seated. Thank you. The state has rested. Mr. Owens, um, do you have any intention on putting on a sir rebuttal in this case, sir? Yes, sir. Judge, um, we did not intend to put on a sober bottle. Okay, thank you. All right, Ms. Boone, I've got a couple of questions to go over with you, ma'am. You were previously sworn this morning. Um, you've had the opportunity to review and participate in the trial. You've had the opportunity to review the rebuttal case as provided by the state. You've had the opportunity to review and listen to that evidence and witness any cross-examinations as, as it relates to the state's witnesses in their rebuttal case. Are you satisfied with your attorney's representation of you in this matter? Definitely. And are you still on board with the strategy that has been utilized in your defense? Yes. Now, your lawyers yesterday told the court that they may want to put on a sir rebuttal, which would be a limited rebuttal to the evidence presented by the state in their rebuttal both yesterday and today. Your lawyers have indicated that they have, do not intend on doing that. Similar to other conversations we've had, ma'am, I don't want to know specifics. I just want to know if you and your lawyers have had these conversations. Have you had a conversation with your attorneys about putting on a sir rebuttal or a reply in response to the state rebuttal? You had that conversation. Are you on board with the strategy employed by your lawyers that they are not seeking to put on a sir rebuttal in this case? I am. Okay. All right. Is there anything else that we need to address? State. Yes, Judge, you remember you were going to say? Yes, thank you, sir. Um, Ms. Boone, at the conclusion of the state's presentation of State's Exhibit 21, uh, Mr. Owens had approached and had advised the court of some objections, specifically with regard to uh, the co-ownership or co-usage of the phone. The court is not permitted to comment on the evidence. And your lawyer was seeking an instruction from the court to advise our jury that both you and Mr. Torres had access to that cell phone. I am prohibited from commenting on the evidence. Now, that doesn't prevent your lawyer or the state from uh, speaking about that in their closing arguments. Just as a matter of law, I am not able to advise the jury as to what that evidence is. The second request pertained to uh, the state moving from place to place, to place uh, in uh, through those 108 pages, moving from timestamp to timestamp. The state chose to present uh, that evidence in that manner, which is why I gave that instruction to the jury that not the entirety of Exhibit 21 was provided to them as to what the state produced, and they'll have to have the opportunity to review that in its entirety uh, when they go to deliberate. Do you have any questions about that so far? So far, no. Okay. The last portion, ma'am, pertained to the cadence or tone in which you and Mr. Torres communicated with each other. I have no knowledge as to how you and Mr. Torres communicated in text form as to what the tone was behind those words. Your lawyer advised me that there was an objection and you had some concerns as to the way Mr. J may have read those text messages to the jury. I found that the way that he read them was benign in a flat tone and did not exacerbate or excite any of the language that was in there. He'd read them in as a monotone way as possible and presenting to the jury. And I didn't notice any changes in his cadence or heightening or lowering in the volume or tense or tone utilized in presenting that information to the jury. Do you have any other questions for me, ma'am? 
No. Anything else we need to address, Mr. Owens? No, sir. Anything else we need to address, State? Yes. Okay. Um, how would we like to proceed with the charging conference? Do we want to bring back in our jury? It is 1033 and advise them. This is when we think you want to come back because we're going to be addressing the law to provide to you. And that's something I need to do outside of your presence. How do we want to proceed at this time? Um, I think hopefully at 1033 to about noon should do it for 3.6 F. It is convoluted, but I think the parties have narrowed it down to really just a couple of things. Okay. Um, so I would suggest saying something along the lines of we have to finish up getting the jury instructions ready for you. That's something that we have to, have to do now after the evidence is completed, and we'll see at one. I say one thirty, Judge, in the buzz's caution, because uh, look, Mr. Harrison, I know this is going to be a, a, a an issue. And it's going to take a little bit of time, and then we want to go to lunch and give them a chance because there's going to be a three-hour speech session. I don't know if you give them a break in between prosecutor's statement and my statement. Mm -hmm. or how you do we that. may, depending on just the time of it. But from 1.30, that's going to go to 2.30, 3.30, 4.30. So just before 5, I, I, I think that's plenty of time in case he goes a little bit longer, I get a little bit. And I still have to read the jury instructions as well. So, I mean, with 34 pages and I read quickly, as Madam Court Reporter will advise me. Um, yes. Yes. So once we make all these changes, every member in the box will have a paper copy. You, Mr. Owens, and your team, along with Ms. Boone, will have a copy. State will have a copy. Madam Court Reporter will have a copy. And I will. And I will read line by line all the way up into the 2.7 instruction. At that point in time, I will stop. I will advise our jury that we're going to begin with closings. State will go. You will go. State will have an opportunity for rebuttal. And then I'll finish with the verdict and final instructions. Discharge our alternates at that time. Um, I'll go back and thank them and give them their jury certificate forms. And then um, we'll release the jury. I'll have a final colloquy with your client. And then we'll review all the evidence to send back with the exception of the baseball bat. And perhaps in case they haven't inferred, let them know that they're getting the case tonight to so make plans to stay with them. Yes. How late are you going to keep them? Nine o'clock is the norm. Um, I may, because it's the weekend and it's Friday, I may seek special dispensation from the chief to stay longer. Um, uh, I plan on communicating with the chief during the lunch hour as to that issue. I think that would be good. If she'll let me. I, I don't know if it's at her discretion. Uh, I know I have to seek approval after seven. Um, I'm not worried about that. I know. And I'm, I, I would prefer them to work late into the evening if they're on board with doing that rather than coming back Monday. Okay. All right. Um, if you all would be so kind to give me a moment so I can go back up to chambers, get with Ms. Barrios, and I'll give paper copies of everything from the revisions that we made this morning. Let's go ahead and bring back in our jury. And I agree with Mr. Owens. I'd rather us waiting on them than them waiting on us. So I think 1.30 is the way to fly. Let's go ahead and bring back in our jury. State, do you recognize our jury? Yes, Your Honor. Defense, do you recognize our jury? Yes, sir. I thank you. Y'all can be seated. Members of the jury number two in the back, he's he's ready. He gets it. All right, can you raise those hands one more time for me? All right, record reflect uh, hands have been raised as compliance with regard to the court's instructions. 
Members of the jury, all the evidence and testimony sought to be provided by the state and the defense have been provided to us over the last week. At this point in time, the state and the defense and I need to discuss the law to be given to you in instructions. That's going to take a little bit of time. So we're going to go ahead and excuse you at this point in time for a longer lunch break than what you've had previously. And we're going to ask you to come back here at 1.30. At that point in time, the court will begin to instruct you on the law that you are to apply in this case. Then the parties will begin with their closing arguments. The state will go first, then the defense. Then the state will have the opportunity to rebut any of the defense's arguments. After hearing the closing arguments, the court will provide you final instructions before releasing you to deliberate in this matter. We may work past nine o'clock tonight. We may go late into the evening. So if there are any plans or things that you need to reach out to, as we discussed last week during jury selection, that we could work till late as nine, and we may work later than that this evening. If there's anyone that has any concerns as to working that late, please raise your hands at this time. Court sees no hands. I would also ask of you, if you could, please reach out to any family members or friends to one, advise them that you're on the jury and will be deliberating this evening. And if there's any uh, accommodations or issues with minor children or family that need to be taken care of, I would ask you that you take care of that during our lunch break. And the emergency phone numbers? Yes, we will provide you. Uh, the court deputy will provide you the emergency phone number when we get back from lunch so that you can provide that during a break that we'll have this afternoon to any friends or family or loved ones if they need to get in contact with you. I will give you a similar instruction that I've given you over the last couple of days. I know you're probably tired of it, but I got to give it to you one more time. Jurors, you must not conduct any investigation on your own. This includes reading newspapers, watching television, or using a computer, cell phone, the internet, any electronic device, or any other means at all to get information related to this case or the people and places involved in this case. This applies whether you are in the courthouse, <laughs> at home, or anywhere else. You must not visit places mentioned in the trial or use the internet to look at maps or pictures to see any place discussed during the trial. Jurors do not watch local news or read local newspapers. Jurors must not have discussions of any sort with friends, family members, or even your fellow jurors about the case or the people and places involved. So do not let anyone make comments to you or ask questions about the trial. I want to stress again, the just as you must not talk about this case face to face, you must not talk about this case by using an electronic device. You must not communicate, excuse me, you must not use phones, computers, or electronic devices to communicate. Do not send or accept any messages related to this case or your jury's service. Do not discuss this case or ask for advice by any means at all, including posting information on an internet website, chat room, or blog. With that, members of the jury, I thank you for your attentiveness, service, and sacrifice. We'll see you at 1.30. Juror number two in the back. Yes, sir. So Answer. We're going to be here for some time. Can we leave and come back and get the stand for the thing? We will have you that answer when we come back. Okay. Madam Clerk's going to figure that out for you. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay. Could you do that, Officer Jones? So uh, I've been advised, but you know, rather than double speak, could you just tell me what it was? Say it for the record. What it, it was? Judges approved that they are to go on campus or the courthouse on the garage. They can come back and get new stamps. So they can leave this point. And I'll approve that. So, um, state anything else we got to discuss? Other than the jury instructions. Uh, Defense. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, court's going to run upstairs, uh, put the finishing touches um, on what we agreed to this morning. I'll bring back paper copies for everyone, and then we can continue the charging conference. At that time, court's going to be in a short recess. We'll be back as promptly as possible. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
We're back on the record, 2020 CF 2603, State of Florida versus Sarah Boone. Let me get appearances for the state. Defense? Tony Henderson for Sarah Boone. Yeah. Back on behalf of Sarah Boone, Okay. Um, where might Mr. Owens be? Judge, Mr. Owens is doing some preparation. I am. Okay. If the state and the defense can approach, I have paper copies of the revised jury instruction. You'll see on the bottom of each page is a file and path name. That's just for my own edification of where I've stored them. So then we make additional changes. <clears throat> um, the revisions that we discussed earlier today have already been made. There's still a couple of cleanups that I need to do uh, just to get rid of the formatting uh, items. But all the revisions that we spoke about this morning have been included. Uh, with that, I think that takes us to page 9 of 28 in the uh, 3.6F instruction. I also have the defendant's revised um, portions as to 3.6. Just for the court's clarification is what is in page 9 of 28 of what was provided to the parties. Is that the same as the uh, separate Defense 3.6F instruction? Yes, sir. Also, Got it. Okay. So should we be relying on the 3.6F instruction you, Ms. Henderson, sent last night? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. State, do you have that? Okay. All right. Um, tell me when you uh, have it pulled up in front of you, sir, and then we'll... It's pulled up. And, uh, I sent it to the state's so pulled up as well. Okay. Very good. All right. Um, let me pull up the digital copy that I have. Give me a moment. Okay. All right, the court has the 3.6F instruction as provided by the defense. As to the first paragraph, it is a defense to the crime, bracket S bracket, of second degree murder and culpable negligence if the actions of Sarah Boone constituted the justifiable use of or threatened use of deadly force. What say the state as to this instruction? And should not manslaughter be included? It should be second degree murder, comma, manslaughter, and multiple negligence. Okay. Any objection to that addition? No, you're wrong. Okay. Judge? Yes, sir. Can I? And I'll just because there's a special instruction that the state is requesting on causation. Yes. And that goes, it's going to come before the self-defense. When the, it was used in the previous case that I cited, that I used it in um, a couple years ago, um, it's part of the instructions in the second department. Yes, before I would be requested. And this is just so that we're all on the same page. Forgive me. This is the state's request for special jury instruction on causation. Yes, sir. I suggest we table that. Now, okay. All right. So we'll revisit the state's request at that point in time. Um, so is the second pair or the first full paragraph is read. Is that acceptable to the defense? Yes, you are. Okay. Moving now to the deadly force definition. It seems to track the language of the stat of the proposed jury instruction completely. Any revisions to that state? No, sir. Defense. Your instruction. So I'm assuming you've got no quarrel with it. No, you are. Moving to the next paragraph, I also believe that that's from the Form 3.6 instruction. State, any issue with the third full paragraph? So in my request, I struck through for threatening to use each time because the evidence doesn't support that. What the evidence supports is she did actually use force. Um, it wasn't a threat of force. Um, so I think it's unnecessary, confusing, and not supported by the evidence. We have that clause. Each of the paragraphs that's mentioned. 
response defense. Judge, I have no problem with that. I was just, when I put it in, uh, I just was throwing out some statements that the state had to make in different arguments. First one, talking about aggravated assault. Okay. So just so that I'm clear, you've got no objection to the removal of that language. So the third paragraph would now read, Sarah Boone does not have the burden of proving that she was justified in utilizing, excuse me, justified in using deadly force. Instead, for you to find Sarah Boone guilty, the state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Sarah Boone was not justified in using deadly force. Is that correct, state? Is that correct, defense? Yes. All right, very good. Yes, sir. And Mr. Henderson, you don't need to stand up every time, sir. I appreciate it. I'm sorry, but it's old. I, I get it. <laughs> but it's out of habit. Uh, Judge, every time that comes up, you lose it. Yes. Understood. So then just let's go back to the title then. Can we revise the title to 3.6F, justifiable use of deadly force, and remove that bracketed or threatened use language? It should just be used. Okay, very good. All right. The next sentence, the law on the justifiable use of deadly force is as follows. Is that acceptable? Say it. Just the strike through. Uh, right as I read it, yes. Yeah. Is that acceptable defense? Yes, Your Honor. Moving now, Sarah Boone was justified in using deadly force if she reasonably believed that such force or threat of force was necessary to prevent a imminent death or great bodily harm to herself. Is that acceptable to the state? It's acceptable. I'm just confirmed that they don't want me. Yes, confirmed. Only what would be read would be A. That's correct. Okay. All right. Is that acceptable state with that understanding? Yes, sir. Okay. Moving now to the next portion. Sarah Boone had no duty to retreat before using deadly force. I mean, my review of the case law, and I don't recall which one it is, is that if you're on your own home, you don't have to retreat. My uh, understanding of the facts was that she used force first uh, by zipping him up in the suitcase and doing so that, one, she could make him feel like he had made her feel in the past for choking and cheating on her, and two, to give her a platform to be able to speak to him uh, as a captive audience. And, he would have to listen. Um, because she took the actions of an initial aggressor, um, it is our position that there is a duty to retreat um, caused by the initial aggression is that it's addressed lower in the jury trial. Response, defense. Judge, I, um, I have a different view of the evidence. I think what the evidence has said about the initial in the suitcase is that Mr. Torres was getting into the suitcase and positioning himself into the suitcase when Miss Boone uh, came down. There was laughter between the two of them. The suitcase was zipped. Uh, and it was a consensual deal. It was a consensual thing. So she didn't use any threat or use of force at that time to zip him in the suitcase. Furthermore, during the demonstration and when uh, they were demonstrating the suitcase and the, and the zipping ability, I know time has passed, but I hadn't seen anything different to keep someone in there who didn't want to be in there. Uh, if someone didn't want to be in there, it would be almost literally impossible to zip that suitcase because how much force it took to zip that suitcase. So the, the evidence doesn't support that. Doesn't support a duty to retreat? Correct. Because what they're saying, going back even before we had stand your ground, just going back to the castle doctrine, there was never a duty to retreat from your home. So then if I understand your argument, you are not seeking to have this included then? I, I am seeking... Because if I, you're saying she had no duty to retreat, that's this talks about... It, it, hang on. Let me, let me just reread it. Okay. So I think I follow your argument. Okay. Now, what I'm saying is weird the, that it should be no duty to treat, that Sarah Boone had no duty to retreat. That's what we're requesting. 
I believe the state's objecting to that and saying that it is a dispute. So they want the next paragraph as to the court. But there is there is nothing that showed at that time because the state's arguing that she forcefully put him in the suitcase. Response. That's a strong argument. Uh, that is not the state's argument. We know what the evidence in this case is. The evidence that she provided was he got into that suitcase by himself and they were playing hide and seek and he uh, was inside but not completely hidden. The lid was flapping over him. She came over and zipped it shut to whether it's 100% or near 100% shut. It was all in fun and jest at first, but he did indicate, and we saw it on the video, uh, image IMG underscore 1062, Sarah, I can't breathe. Sarah, I can't breathe. Um, he was being held against his will in that suitcase. That There is no requirement that she uh, initially forced him into it or not. Um, it's no different than two people wrestling and play fighting and one person has another person in a headlock and then there comes a point in time where I'm tapping out. Jorge Torres was tapping out and that's on video and it's in her testimony. It's uncontroverted. Um, there is sufficient evidence for there to be a dispute as to whether or not she was the initial aggressor um, and whether that generates a duty to retreat. Quite frankly, it's undisputed evidence because it's uniquely only her testimony coupled with the video. She restrained him in that suitcase on purpose and intentionally. And if you look at the elements of aggravated assault in um, our proposed jury instruction, that is exactly what was going on. She intended for him to feel fearful of an inability to breathe, to make it feel like he had made her feel when she choked, uh, he had choked her. The aggravated assault is defined as follows. Sarah Boone intentionally and unlawfully threatened, either by word or act, to do violence to George Torres. She would not let him out. She would not release the headlock um, when he indicated he could not breathe. At the time, Sarah Boone appeared to have the ability to carry out the threat. Well, the video evidence is uh, race ipsa loquitur. Uh, he could not get out on his own. He could not get out on his own at 11 12 in the first movie. He could not get out on his own at 11 23 in the second movie. And quite frankly, he couldn't get out at 11 03 during the still photo as well. Element three the act of Sarah Boone created in the mind of George Torres a well founded fear that violence was about to take place. Absolutely. Sarah, I can't breathe. Babe, I can't fucking breathe. Sarah, Sarah, shh, go fuck yourself. The assault was made with a deadly weapon, element four. An object not designed to inflict bodily harm may ne nevertheless be a deadly weapon if it is used or threatened to be used in a manner likely to cause death or great bodily harm. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it did cause death. So that's not a dispute. So it's our position that she was the initial aggressor based on her testimony that we received from court, and that is going to be put into play um, to be the retreat, and that the parties need to argue about that. Anything further, Mr. Anderson? Yes, Judge. I, I want to clarify this because what the initial thing in getting into the suitcase, the act is zipping the suitcase up. That act of, of zipping the suitcase up was not done forcefully. He, the testimony was he agreed. He was in the suitcase. He was the one who got into the suitcase to begin with. He agreed. He, the suitcase was zipped up and there was no argument at that time. All right. He and just by the demonstration that they gave, you could see somebody to get in that suitcase or not get out of it at that time wanted to be in that suitcase. And it's nothing to dispute what she says that he agreed. She zipped the suitcase and they both laughed and thought it was funny. Now, the next thing that the state goes to is an omission. It is not an act. It is an omission at that point in time where she's saying when they say, oh, he can't breathe. Well, she doesn't go. Let him out. So they're saying, uh, so they're trying to make that an act when it is not, when she just did not let him out. It's different. And what we're talking about is just the duty to retreat at this time. We're not even talking about the other parts 
that's the thing. But as to the duty to retreat, she's in her home. And at that point in time, when that act took place, she had no duty to retreat. Here's, here's what the form instruction says. If it is undisputed by the parties that the defendant had no duty to retreat, give the following sentence. Defendant had no duty to retreat before using or threatening to use deadly force. Instruction goes on to read, if the parties dispute whether the defendant had a duty to retreat, give the following paragraph. Sounds like both of y'all, A, do not, it is, are disputing whether or not there's a duty to retreat. Yeah. So I think I have to, based on what the Florida Supreme Court's instruction to me is, is to give that second paragraph. State, anything further? No. Defense, anything further? Just note the objection, but I understand. Okay. All right. So the, um, the language in the red line from the defense as to Sarah Boone had no duty to retreat before using deadly force will be removed. And I will um, add in the state's proposed language, which tracks the form instruction. Is there any objection? Do you want me to read that to you, Mr. Henderson? No, I'll read it real quick. Okay. And I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. That's the state's proposed revisions to the 3.6 F on the top of page two of seven. Yeah. I'd ask that the court would. Sure. Okay. If Sarah Boone was not committing any crime other than the alleged second degree murder or manslaughter. For okay. I will add that. Thank you. For which, so it'll read, if Sarah Boone was not committing any crime other than the alleged second degree murder or manslaughter or culpable negligence for which the defendant is claiming self-defense or defense of others. And if she was in a place where she had a right to be, then the defendant had no duty to retreat or for using deadly force. On the other hand, one, if at the time Sarah Boone used deadly force, she was committing an aggravated assault or if at the time Sarah Boone used deadly force, she was not in a place where she had a right to be, then the defendant had a duty to retreat. The duty to retreat means the defendant had the legal obligation to use every reasonable means to avoid any danger before using deadly force. The law does not require the defendant to retreat if she was placed in imminent danger of death or great bodily harm, or imminent danger of the commission of parentheses applicable forced felon, forcible felony, and parentheses against herself, and it would have increased her own danger to retreat, or if retreat would have been futile. But if the defendant had a duty to retreat, and if she could have safely retreated but did not do so, then her use of deadly force was not justifiable. Do you have a question as to the applicable forcible felony? I wish that A and B. That's, that's for her. A and B are very serious. So that's not true. That is correct. So then that sentence would re be revised to the law does not require the defendant to retreat if she was placed in imminent danger of death or great bodily harm. And it would have increased her own danger to retreat. Yes. What say you, Mr. Henderson? Judge, I enter objection as to the the instruction. As the state has included to get this instruction, an aggravated assault, which is not charged in the information. State response. Judge, um, I'm happy to hop into that one as well. Okay. Um, I understand what Martinez versus State says. I'm sure you've all read the opinion. It's in my motions. Um, and I understand what it holds. What it says all throughout the opinion is there needs to be an independent forceful felony. And then at the very, very end of the opinion, then it says there needs to be an independent felony charged. Why I'm asking for a special jury instruction, uh, and I've made that request in writing, is because under the standard jury instruction that we are going through right now, um, it says, according to Martinez versus State, 
that the independent forcible felony needs to be charged. The whole purpose of this is you can't engage into a circular logic uh, argument that defeats this boom's right to self-defense. So it would be preposterous to include in this jury instruction, Ms. Boone um, did not have a right to use justifiable use of deadly force uh, by committing secondary murder against the victim when that's the charge offense. But she, of course, would have the right to use deadly force to defend herself against the, the victim, and that would be correct. But what we have in this case, and what the state has alerted the court and the defendant to well before trial was, the evidence shows that she committed a separate aggravated assault. She, at the time that she had already zipped him shut in there, and again, just because she releases that quote-unquote chokehold by sitting on the couch, she is exerting that force through distance because she's the one that zipped him shut. So she, in using that force, is the one who did that in purpose to make him feel like he was choking and make him feel like she, uh, he had made her feel like she was getting cheated on, and to intentionally confine him in a place um, so that she could speak to him about her thoughts. As I already outlined, it's the state's position and the evidence does support that this is an aggravated assault. She intentionally put him in fear of death. She relished it. She relished it for that two-minute video. That is prior to when she says, well, now he's sticking his fingers out and I get scared by that action. And by that action, it's George Torres just trying to exert the will to live, to survive and be on this earth. Um, that now that, that action, if he, his attempt to escape out of the suitcase that she has left him zipped up in is this independent uh, threat of great bodily harm and death to her. She testifies if he gets out, it's her belief that he will beat her up, kill her, disfigure her, so on and so forth. In her testimony at trial, I believe she said, was, I will, he said that I will end you. So what we have here is they, by their own admissions, um, through the testimony that she provided, that there is a separate and distinct independent forcible felony from what ends up being the second degree murder. What ends up now being the second degree murder is at this point in time when she says, well, he's, he's trying to get out. I'm afraid if he gets out, I'm going to get disfigured or killed. And so that is why Ms. Boone makes the decision. I'm not even going down the aggravated battery path. Um, but she batters him with a bat on the hands and batters him, pokes him while he's in the suitcase and basically beats him into submission so that he stops trying to escape. That's was. And then she makes the decision to now leave him and go upstairs and go to sleep without having relieved him from the force that she exerted earlier in an aggravated assault. So like the example I gave you earlier, this is absolutely no different than me pointing a gun at you, judge, and putting you in fear of your life that I'm going to shoot you and a projectile is going to enter your body kill you or give you great bodily harm. And you, in turn, after having been placed in fear by me pointing a gun at you, you begin to defend yourself and exert your right to live on this earth by pulling your own firearm. And now, do I, as the initial aggressor, the initial person who committed the forcible felony of aggravated assault on you, under the law, I don't have the right now to defend myself against you. I need to retreat. I need to make it clear. Sorry, man, my bad. Drop my gun and walk away. That is what is the law. 776041 is a very short and very, very simple statute. And it has not changed since 2014. This has been the law. This was the law at the time of this offense in 2020. 776041 provides 
The justification described in the preceding sections of this chapter is not available to a person who, one, is attempting to commit, committing, or escaping the commission of a forcible felony. So taking away the firearm uh, example, it's a chokehold. His cause of death, according to the medical examiner, was asphyxiation by uh, position and uh, environmental suffocation caused by her not releasing a chokehold on him when he indicated, babe, I can't breathe, Sarah, help. That is an independent forcible felony, separate and distinct now from what she says is the victim, like you pulling a gun uh, to defend yourself from me pulling a gun on you. Now, the threatened use of force that the victim is exerting is sticking his hands out and saying, I'm going to end you. That is the distinct uh, break between the aggravated assault and now her continuing to use this unlawful force, which she's not entitled to do because she started it. She was the initial aggressor in committing this aggravated assault. And she ends up just leaving him to die and never releasing the chokehold. And the unlawful threat is what's on the video in, in your realm. Yes. Okay. And, and any facts that support that should cause this jury instruction to be given. The absolute only hang up about whether or not this jury instruction should be given is because Martinez slightly overstates what is necessary to prevent this circular logic, which is not going to occur in this case. There is not going to be any arguments by the state um, that she does not have the right to defend herself if um, she is in imminent fear or death of great bodily harm by the victim. She testified that him sticking his hands out of the suitcase and saying, I'm going to end you, put her in fear of imminent death and great bodily harm. And in turn, what she did was she decided to not let him out. And he ended up dying. And that is second degree murder. That is separate than what preceded that. What preceded that was her not letting him out when he, you can see him pushing up on the suitcase in the video, begging to get let out. And she doesn't because she is doing this out of anger, hatred, ill will, and spite to teach him a lesson and put him in fear of death or great bodily harm. That's an aggravated assault. I would absolutely charge her with aggravated assault and aggravated battery, separate independent forcible felonies, if I could. But I did not learn this information until after the statute of limitations had passed. That is through no fault of the states. Um, so we absolutely would, if we could, and we are not going to make the argument and defeat her uh, defense of second degree murder by saying, well, you can't you can't defend yourself with second. You know, I understand what they're getting at in Martinez. That's not this case, though. They're, it's broken down into those parts. Can I have the citation for Martinez? Because unless I missed it in your motions, I didn't see Martinez cited in the motions. I'm sorry. And forgive me if I missed no, it's been it. in previous uh, motions. Um, Because you cited a cologne with regard to the Miranda issue. No, I'm, I'm referring to, there's a pleading entitled state's request for forcible felony instruction and request for initial aggressor instruction, which we've kind yes. of hopped into now since aggravated assault is being mentioned in this paragraph. Um, in paragraph. Oh, there it is. I apologize. Yeah, paragraphs 12 through um, 31 are the legal analysis and Martinez is cited in there. At paragraph 19 at 981 Southern 2nd 449 Florida 2008. And more importantly, what Martinez doesn't say is that there's like some requirement that the, the verdicts would be interlocking. Like there, there's no requirement that second degree murder be count one and aggravated assault be count two. And then, um, you know, if they return a not guilty verdict on aggravated assault, then um, there has to be a not guilty verdict on the second degree murder. That's, that's not the case because there's so many different prongs to the self-defense instructions. So it's not required to be charged for some reason of an interlocking verdict. Um, and the whole spirit of that opinion is that it is to make sure that we do not defeat her self-defense argument that she's entitled to make about why she committed second degree murder. Um, all we're saying is you're not entitled to uh, defend yourself in that manner if you committed an aggravated assault to start this. 
And that's what the facts show. It's a little complicated. And there's a, another special jury instruction related to this force by distance. Um, you know, it's like tying somebody to some train tracks and walking away. I mean, are you still choking the person? No. But are they restrained in a manner that if a train comes, they will die? Yes. Um, so the special circumstances of this case and the facts um, are going to warrant, in the state's estimation, the forcible felony paragraph, and then that language being placed into this initial paragraph that we're talking about. Just reading Martinez, give me a moment. Yes, sir. And then just for the record, the three prongs for a special jury instruction, which I cited in a couple of my other meetings. The special jury instruction is warranted when A, the special instruction is supported by the evidence, which is the case. In fact, undisputed since there was only one person there. B, the standard instruction did not adequately cover the legal theory it is meant to. That is also true. And C, the special instruction has a was a correct statement of the law and not misleading or confusing. That is also the case. Stevens, S T E P H E N S versus State, 787, Southern Second, 747. And I say it's 755 is the pinpoint. Yeah, 2000. Yeah, I reviewed that already. Thank you. Response. Response is clear, Judge. They, they're trying to make exceptions for the law. That doesn't do. That doesn't work here. Simply this: what the requirement is under Martinez to get the aggressor is this. It's only applicable and only and only in cases where the defendant was charged with either an independent forcible felony. That's Martinez, or B, felony murder. There is, that's a different case. And Martinez, they have not charged an independent forcible felony. So it doesn't apply. It tells us right there, that's the standard jury instruction. For him to come back here and say, well, really, Judge, they overstated Martinez, Martinez is still good law. It has not been changed. That's the rule. That's the requirement. But, but this is relying. The Martinez opinion states, indeed, consistent with this case law in 2006, we approved an amendment to the self-defense jury instruction to specifically provide that the forcible felony instruction should be given, quote, only if the defendant is charged with more than one forcible felony. That doesn't seem to be what the new instruction says, unless I'm missing something. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Sure. Last, the sentence says, indeed, consistent with this case law, in 2006, we approved an amendment to the self-defense jury instruction to specifically provide that the forcible felony instruction should be given, quote, only if the defendant is charged with more than one forcible felony. And unless I'm missing something, a 3.6F instruction doesn't say that now. The form instruction. Yes. When it comes to the aggressor in the standard jury instruction, when it comes to aggressor, and they're talking about under 776.041 sub 1, it get, it's to only be given if and only in cases where the defendant is charged with either an independent forcible felony. You cannot give this instruction unless there's an independent forcible uh, felony that he, that Ms. Boone has been charged with. And there just isn't one. But where, right. does, it, where does it say that in the form instruction? Judge. Yes. It's page 14 and 28. Aggressor, 776-041-1, Florida statute, give a foot in only cases where the defendant is charged either A, the independent forcible felony, Martinez versus State, 981-449, or the felony. And 
we're acknowledging that. But when you look at the case, what is the stating is, the purpose of that is there has to be in the evidence an independent forcible felony. And that is what occurred in this case. She committed an aggravated assault. After that, the defendant, the defendant is saying the victim placed her in fear of imminent harm or death by trying to escape her aggravated assault, by sticking his fingers out, and by saying, as he's trying to escape, I'm going to end you. But, but isn't that in the giving the aggressor definition? I mean, is that, unless I miss something, that's not what we're talking about right now. I agree, but it's, it's co, I think it cohabitates together. Okay. And it's our position, we absolutely would charge her. And it's a legal technicality and part of this standard instruction that we can't because of the statute of limitations. We all know, all of us here together as attorneys, know that those facts, if believed by the jury, support that she violated Chapter 776-041-1. She should not be able to get away with murder because of a statute of limitations technicality that was through no fault of the state's own. The purpose and spirit of Martinez is to make sure that we're not up there arguing. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, she had no right to defend herself uh, from an imminent threat of harm by killing somebody. That's not what we're going to say. We understand that. What we are going to say is, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, she had no right to leave him in that suitcase out of fear and great, great bodily harm or imminent death because she committed an aggravated assault to put him in that predicament. That is, that's the evidence in the case. That's the arguments that's going to be made. That's why we're making a special instruction request um, based on the unique facts and circumstances of this particular case. Give me a second. Yes. The proposed the language in the instruction in pertinent part says he or she was committing an act, insert the defendant's criminal activity that the defendant act, but the criminal activity cannot be the charged crimes for which the defendant is claiming self-defense or the defense of others. The charged crime is second degree murder. So I'm struggling with understanding as the other crime is because you're not taking, I'm not hearing any argument as to the applicability of aggravated assault. Judge. Because, and I didn't make any argument about it. Aggravated assault applying because they can't get over the first hurdle. The first hurdle is it has to be charged. It's not charged. That's what the case law says. I mean, this is pretty clear to me, unless I'm looking at it wrong, when it says this is not to be given if there isn't an independent forcible felony charged. Any other response, State? Just that it defeats the purpose of the statute. And is manifestly unjust when it is a legal technicality of no import. 
there is no interlocking uh, verdict required. If, if we had, if we were able to charge aggravated assault, there's no requirement that they both be found guilty. They could go ahead and hear this instruction and find her not guilty of aggravated assault and still convict her of second degree murder because of all the plethora of permutations we have in this instruction. But in Martinez, the underlying charge was attempted murder and aggravated battery, both of which were charged, and we don't have that here. But it's still going to the one act, you know, those facts. We are talking about separate, clearly distinct facts here that support there's an aggravated assault that separately gets committed first, and then in response to the victim responding to that aggravated assault, she leaves him in the chokehold to die because if she lets him out, it's her belief she's going to face death or great bodily harm because she committed a forcible felony. This is purely a legal technicality. The entire opinion on Martinez, until the very last paragraph, uses this language. They use language like the underlying facts of the pre present case demonstrate why it would be illogical to conclude that section 776041 N1 applies where there is no independent forcible felony. It doesn't say where there is no independent forcible felony charged. It goes on and uses that same language all throughout the opinion. And then in the very last paragraph in the conclusion, it changes to in conclusion, we hold that it is error for a trial court to read the forcible felony instruction to the jury where the defendant is not charged with an independent forcible felony. But there is an independent forcible felony in the facts. There is a statute that says that Ms. Boone should not be able to uh, get the benefit, avoid the, uh, the girth of this jury instruction. She violated, according to the facts that she gave us, she violated 776041 paren 1. She was committing an independent forcible felony and therefore um, should not be able to get away with this instruction not being given because the technicality that the state can't charge a case or can't charge a count that is not required to be interlocked by verdict. Thank you. Okay. Footnote four provides, you know, explanation in the Martinez opinion as to a certain circumstances and whether or not in that hypothetical that the Supreme Court gave, whether the robbery is a separate and independent forcible felony and the forcible felony instruction is applicable. But the conclusion seems to state that it has to be charged. That it is an error for the trial court to read the forcible felony instruction to the jury where the defendant is not charged with the independent forcible felony. Anything else, Mr. J? Yes, sir. Then how do we want to accomplish this? Because I don't know how I can read the proposed language by the state. And there's a disagreement as to whether there's a duty to retreat. And it's not undisputed. It is, in fact, disputed. Well, their complaint is in the sentence. On the other hand, if at the time Sarah Boone used deadly force, she was, um, and I just think you strike through, you strike through committing an aggravated assault. Um, you know, she, if at the time Sarah Boone used deadly force, 
Okay. And unless you just want to go to two, on the other hand, if at the time defendant used deadly force, she was not in a place where she had a right to be, then the defendant had an obligation to, or excuse me, then the defendant had a duty to retreat, just excise one completely. I, I don't know what else to do. Right. Under the castle doctrine in the case law. Okay, then I think we go with first paragraph and then and just deal with the initial aggressor at the end of the exception to that. So, okay, so then Sarah Boone, had, Sarah Boone had no duty to retreat before using deadly force. Yes. Okay, is that acceptable to the defense? Yes. Sure. I think it puts us back in the position where we started at anyway. Yes. Okay, all right. I just object for the record in case it's coming. Objection noted. It looks like the next parts of the form instruction, if the defendant was in a dwelling, was excised, the give A, B, or C was excised. Are you on board with that state? Yes. Sim then the next paragraph, a person is not justified in using force to resist an arrest. Clearly, that's not applicable. I don't think that's at odds. However, if an officer used excessive, I also don't believe that's applicable based on the facts. We then proceed to the give in all cases language. Uh, any objection to this language state? Sure. The bottom of page two of the defendant's 3.6F red line. I'm just uh, finding where it works. On the form instruction, it's the bottom of page three of seven given all cases, right after Jackson v. State. Yes, the agreed upon strike to the more threatened use. So just being deciding whether Sarah Boone is justified in use of deadly force, you must consider the circumstances at the time. Any objection? No objection to that, Chair. Okay. We'll re excise the threatened use, so it'll all read use of deadly force in that paragraph. All right, now we have a proposed instruction, I believe from the defense regarding battered spouse. We table the battered spouse proposed instructions since both parties have that? Sure. Moving now to the presumption of fear, that's been struck out by both parties and agreed to. Moving to the exceptions of presumption of fear, that's been struck out by both parties and not necessary. That takes us to a person who unlawfully by force enters or attempts to enter. That's not applicable. Definition of dwelling is not applicable. Residence and vehicle are not applicable. That takes us now to the aggressor language. Um, no additional arguments as to why the facts show the initial aggressor. And thank you for the state. Uh, there's no requirement for this provision that there's an independent force of time. Okay. Uh, it looks like we have a disagreement between the parties as to the application of the aggressor instruction. It's struck out on the defense's side and not in the uh, state side. What say you, Mr. Henderson? Give me one second. Sure. Please. Yes, sir. Thank you. 
right? Are we on 776.041 sub 2? Yes, sir. Okay. If I could have one. Yes, sir. Judge, my own argument would be that the only evidence, well, the evidence from Sarah Boone stated that she did not do anything forcefully wise until after uh, Mr. Torres had made uh, verbal threats and was coming out of the suitcase. Uh, so that's my objection is based on that. No other legal. Any other argument, State? Judge, it's. it's Play wrestling and not releasing the chokehold when your buddy comes up. And I mean, isn't there evidence as to what Miss Boone had told the experts, which seems to be at odds with with that issue? And it's really a factual issue and a determination for the jury to make that determination on what the real facts are. I can't disagree. Okay. Uh, then, with regard to the proposed language, uh, as the uh, 776.0041 sub 2 instruction. However, the use of deadly force is not justified if you find that Sarah Boone was attempting to commit, committing, or escaping after the commission of aggravated assault. An aggravated assault is defined. No. 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 Am, I, am I on the wrong yeah. section? I apologize. I am at the wrong section. Forgive me. So it is the However, my strike is however, the use of deadly force is not justified if you find that Sarah Boone used force to initially provoke the threatened use of force against herself, unless one, the threat of force asserted towards the defendant was so great that she reasonably believed that she was in imminent danger of death or great bodily harm and had exhausted every reasonable means to escape the danger, other than using deadly force on George that spelt incorrectly. Torres or two in good faith, Sarah Boone withdrew from physical contact with George Torres is clear and clearly indicated to George Torres that she wanted to withdraw and stop the use of deadly force. But George Torres continued or resumed threatened use of force. Yes. What's your just for clarification purposes, um, anything else as to that instruction defense? This one thing I need to put on. The record. Yes, sir. The force at that time, uh, as testified to, was the poking of the bat uh, on the outside of the suitcase. It was one strike when the hand was outside. These were, these were bruises. Uh, I think there was something that came to the, the injury to the head area, though. Uh, The injury to the head could be serious, but in this instruction, it's talking about deadly force. And none of those, as to the expert, as to the testimony from the medical examiner, none of those injuries caused the death. The continued restraint on him that she did not undo is the force that we're talking about. It's just like in the cases that I cited in my special case uh, request for special jury instruction regarding withdrawing contact. Batteries don't need to be skin to skin. You can commit a battery on somebody while driving your car and striking their car. A false imprisonment does not mean you have to choke somebody. You can falsely imprison somebody by barricading them into a room with a grocery cart. She unlawfully exerted that force and did not withdraw from using that force when 
her wrestling partner, so to speak, tapped out. Okay. I'm going to include the instruction for now. The next paragraph reads, if you find that Sarah Boone, who, because of prior threats or difficulties, Okay. All right, that'll be included. The next paragraph, if you find that at the time of the alleged aggravated assault and or criminal mischief. Yeah, this just needs to be a second degree murder, manslaughter, or criminal negligence, and we don't object to their more specific acts. Um, Any objection to changing the beginning of that sentence, defense, if you find that at the time of the alleged uh, murder in the second degree, um, manslaughter, Culpable negligence, Sarah Boone knew <clears throat> that George Torres had committed the an act. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And we requested the strike to the end before threatened to use. Agree. Give me a moment. So that sentence would now, or that section would now read, if you find that at the time of the alleged second degree murder, manslaughter, or culpable negligence, Sarah Boone knew that George Torres Jr. had committed an act or acts of violence. You may consider that fact in determining whether Sarah Boone reasonably believed it was necessary for her to use deadly force. Acceptable? Yes, sir. I just don't know that Jr. Give me a moment. Yeah, Jr.'s not used anywhere else, so I'll excise that. Is that acceptable to... You, Mr. Henderson. Yes. Yeah, sure. All right. Moving to the next um, line. If you consider that George Torres removing Jr. had a reputation for being a violent and dangerous person. I don't know. Did we hear evidence of reputation? The state's position is that we heard no reputation evidence. Ms. Boone offered an opinion, uh, but as everybody knows, reputation evidence has become a broad enough aspect of the community. Um, whether it be a church or a neighborhood or perhaps even a large family. But Defense? I'm really thankful. No worries. Take your time. I know generally, and reputation evidence, generally, it has to be something that is known based on the community standard, or right? if that was the community. Uh, I know the only thing that I can relate to is the fact that individually, she experienced certain things that could build that reputation with that on her. Uh, I think there's evidence, though, from people, uh, at least that they knew about it or were told about it. Most of that was stopped. But I could go to at least the one situation on a text message that was introduced earlier today that talked about him beating his uh, former wife or ex wife. How is that reputation? That sounds like that's a specific instance based on that text message. Correct. I agree. Okay. So in agreeing, we're going to excise the reputation yeah. section, correct? Okay. Thank you. The court will excise that. State agrees to the uh, physical abilities that the other part. Uh, what about the one that precedes that? If you find that George Torres had a reputation, well, also that reputation would be removed as well, correct, Mr. Henderson? If you find that George Torres Jr. had a reputation for being a violent and dangerous person, you may consider this fact in determining whether he was the initial aggressor. That's correct. Okay, so that'll be excised as well. State has no objection to the physical. Uh, ability section, I'll just remove the word uh, junior after Torres. Any other questions with regard to the 3.6 F instruction? Your Honor, um, state doesn't object to what we have produced the final uh, product. I'm impressed we did it so quickly. Uh, we just note our objection for the record to preserve a challenge to Martinez. Understood. I it, it just do the parties. Well, let me ask this question, Mr. Henderson. Anything else we need to address with regard to the 3.6F instruction? No, sir. I'd just like to preserve the objections that I'm doing this. Objections preserved. Do the parties wish the court to reread re the 3.6F instruction that we just went through 
just to make sure we're all on the same page. Yes. Can we can we do it at a time where it is in have, is in final form? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Okay. Perhaps a written copy that we take exactly. Sure, absolutely. All right. Um, where does that take us now? Does that take us to the three point six G instruction? Okay, give me a moment. I have state proposed three G instruction. I have the form instruction from the Supreme Court, and I have the <clears throat> defenses proposed <clears throat> revisions. Just move everything around here. Give me a second. Okay. All right. As to the title, uh, I believe that based on what we've discussed, the or threatened use should be removed. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. As to the first sentence, it is a defense to the crimes of second degree murder and culpable negligence of the actions of Sarah Boone constituted the justifiable use of threatened or I'm sorry, threatened use is we're removing uh, justifiable use of de non deadly force. Would we be removing threatening and we would also be including manslaughter, correct? That's correct. State? Yes, sir. It is a defense to the crime of second degree murder, common um, manslaughter, not in Oxford, common or culpable negligence, the actions of Sarah Boone constitute justifiable use of crime. I too am a big fan of the Oxford comma. So the defense would, or the instruction would now read, it is a defense to the crimes of second degree murder, comma, manslaughter, comma, and culpable negligence if the actions of Sarah Boone constituted the justifiable use of non-deadly force. Acceptable state. Yes, sir. Acceptable defense. Yes, sir. Definition of non-deadly force is not at issue. Next paragraph. Um, Sarah Boone does not have the burden of proving that she was justified in using non-deadly force. Instead, for you to find Sarah Boone guilty, the state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Sarah Boone was not justified in using non-deadly force. Acceptable state. Yes, sir. Defense. Yeah, sure. The law on justifiable use of non-deadly force is as follows. Sarah Boone was justified in using non-deadly force against George Torres, excising junior. And had no duty to retreat if she reasonably reasonably believed that such conduct was necessary to defend herself against a George Torres excising junior imminent use of unlawful force. Is that instruction acceptable? Yes, sir. I, I don't know if you mean to include the A if we're not based on this. Any objection? No objection. Okay. Any other issues with the instructions read so far? State? No, sir. Defense? No, Okay. Looks like there are several agreements with the balance of this instruction as to the defense of property is not applicable. The 776.0134 dwelling in residence and vehicle and force with regard to law enforcement, all of which is not applicable in the instant case. That takes us to the give in all cases. Uh, we would be removing the threatened use of non-deadly force in that section. Uh, any other changes is to the give in all cases section. Defense. Not just, no.
Okay. Let's table the proposed instruction and the battered spouse for the moment. Then the state will be making its request for the forcible felony instruction. Um, Under Martinez. Yes. And we understand the court's ruling. We're sending a strongly worded um, disagreement. Received and understood, but based on what the court said earlier as to the conclusion in the Martinez section, I'm disinclined to add your proposed instruction. That takes us now to um, the 776.0412 section. Looks like we have a little bit of a disagreement here. Is it the same arguments that we received in the 3.6 F instruction? It's the same. Any other additional arguments, sir? No, you won't. All right. For the reasons previously identified, um, the court will uh, accept the state's uh, proposed portion as to the 776.0412 instruction. Then it takes us to the prior threats. Same requests and objections uh, as in 3.6. I agree that it should track what the Forgive me. Other than reputation, what what were the other issues? Prior threats should come in. Mm -hmm. Specific acts should come in. Okay, thank you. Reputation should be excised. The two paragraphs of reputation excised. Mm -hmm. Physical abilities get right in all cases. Case. Agreed. Okay. okay. Agreed. All right. Uh, and then we'll remove the threaten language in there, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Any other questions with regard to the 3.6 G instruction state? No, thank you, sir. Defense. Okay. I believe then, just double check my notes. I believe then that addresses those issues based on what uh, we did not discuss this morning in the charging conference. I think that now takes us to the state's requests and the defense's requests for special instructions. We do the battered spouse one first, conflicting requests. Yes. Um, specifically, we're re making reference to the state's request for special jury instruction regarding battered spouse syndrome filed. I believe it was. It's not dated, but I think it was either yesterday, it was either the 23rd or the 24th that you filed these. Um, Mr. J, and the court record will speak for itself as to when they were filed. Excuse me. Okay. Um, courts reviewed that motion and reviewed the proposed instruction by the defense. Um, State, let me hear from you first. Um, with their instruction, I think the problem with it is that it kind of blurs the subjectivity. Component versus the objective reasonable person standard. So if, if we make this change to their instruction, then I'm actually okay with it. What I would suggest that change be is in the second paragraph. If you find the evidence that Sarah Moon suffers from battered spouse syndrome credible, you may consider this evidence to assist you in determining whether a person in Sarah Moon's circumstances would reasonably believe that such force was necessary to defend herself against the permanent use of unlawful force by the victim, no junior, um, that's necessary to take. That makes it clear, because that's what the case law says. The case law makes it very clear. It's about the objective component. I agree with you. And then I would um, just ask for my last sentence, which is like other witnesses, you may believe or disbelieve all or any part of the testimony regarding that stuff. Let's say the defense. And if necessary, I can read. Yes, well, sir. So it looks like there's no, first of all, just so the record's very clear, 
Stevens v. State identifies the special instruction circumstances. Special instruction is supported by the evidence in this case. Yes, absolutely. The standard instruction did not adequately cover the legal theory it is meant to. There is no standard instruction on battered spouse over and above what's included in the self-defense instruction. The special instruction was a correct statement of law and not misleading or confusing. We're addressing that third prong of Stevens at this time. The proposed instruction would read, you have heard evidence that Sarah Boone suffers from battered spouse syndrome. If you find the evidence that Sarah Boone suffers from battered spouse syndrome credible, you may consider this evidence to assist you in determining whether a person in Sarah Boone's circumstances would reasonably believe that such force was necessary to defend herself against the imminent use of unlawful force by George Torres. It would then go on to read, like other witnesses, you may believe or disbelieve all or any part of the testimony regarding battered spouse syndrome. Agreed. Okay. Appreciate y'all working together on that. Give me a moment to finalize this. As such, the third prong of Stevens has been made and the court will give the special instruction as identified on the record. Now, the only question I also have is, do we want this as its own instruction or do we want this included where it currently is in the 3.6F and 3.6G instruction state? I would suggest 3.65, right after the, uh, the two instructions about using I agree with that. Okay. Do we want to label it or just have it as special instruction and then read it? Do we want to have the, the title special instruction on battered spouse? I welcome. I'm fine with the same battered spouse syndrome. Yes. Okay. So it'll be special instruction on battered spouse syndrome. Is that acceptable? Yes, sir. Is that acceptable? Yes. Sir. All right. Thank you. <laughs> And that will follow after the 3.6 G instruction, correct? Yes, sir. Acceptable, yes. Mr. Henderson? Yes, sir. All right, that takes care of that. Yes, I'm sorry, sir. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I think it might be required to repeat it both times after each one. I have no problem with adding paragraph into it that says this applies to both the justifiable use of deadly force and non-deadly force. Okay. Where, gentlemen, do you want that? After the big paragraph that ends with George Torres and before like Sure. Okay. So let's go over that language one more time so that we're all on the same page. Mr. J, what is it that you propose? Uh, to put uh, between the paragraph that ends with George Torres and before the paragraph of Mm -hmm. um, you can consider this testimony and evidence in the uh, applicability or the use of whatever word people agree on of both deadly force and non deadly force. Something that that's too convoluted. I'm fine with it. Just be repeated. I tell you what, I'd rather just repeat it. So. I, I, that gets way complicated. Yeah. I'd rather just repeat it under 3.6F and 3.6G. Okay. Is that work with you, Mr. Anderson? Yes, sir. All right. Thank you, sir. All right. Okay. Moving now to the state's request for special instruction regarding withdrawing from physical contact filed October 23. Uh, 2024, the court has reviewed it. I guess the first question is what say, is there proposed language? I'm trying to see if I'd actually put that in there. I don't know that I see it, Mr. J. Oh, uh, paragraph 15. Physical contact includes any restraint on George Torres, Pren, uh, not Pren, apostrophe movement. And this would be after the initial aggressor portion and the 3.6F and 3.6G, correct? Yes. Okay. What say you? 
Mr. Henderson. If I can have one. Yes, of course. Judge, this is what I'm having a problem with, but I, I think it to be corrected mm -hmm. uh, because they talk about that. As, therefore, at the conclusion of the two paragraphs regarding initial aggressor, it should come in not there, but shouldn't it come in because that's not there anymore. Initially for both. Yeah, in the 3.6 F instruction, uh, references to initial aggressor have been removed. Yes. So... Now is the state asking for it to come in as the initial for both? Unless I unless I missed something. My understanding was that the two paragraphs about aggressor are coming in. What's not coming in is the Martinez force of the that the facts of the case. Right, but but the language you said at the conclusion of the paragraphs regarding initial aggressor. Um, the words initial aggressor don't appear in the 3.6 F. It's only after that, however. The use of deadly force is not justified if you find Sarah Boone used force to initially provoke the threatened use of force against herself unless, and then it's paragraphs one and two. Is that where you're asking it to be? Sure. So on 3.6 F. Mm-hmm. should be, however, the use of deadly force is not justified if you find that Sarah will use force to initially provoke. Correct. The That's what I have. Use of force against herself unless friends one and two. Correct. And then after two, as an explanation for what is listed in friend two as from physical contact, just that elaboration of what, what we're talking about. I got it. This kind of circumstances in this case, um, you know, to remote force. <laughs> Okay, I got it. I just want to make sure we're all on the same page as to where. What say you as to the proposed language of physical contact includes any restraint on George Torres's movement as that portion in 3.6F and in 3.6G? No. Okay. All right. So uh, court's going to grant the state's request for special instruction regarding withdrawing from physical contact. And the language of physical contact includes any restraint on George Torres's movement will be included after the, however, the use of deadly force language 
after paragraph two in the 3.6 F instruction and in the 3.6 G instruction, it will be at the end after the physical abilities section. Um, also, it's George is spelled incorrectly that will be remedied. I thought the two paragraphs about aggressor were being mirrored with 3.6 It shouldn't go after physical abilities. It should go after oh, I'm sorry. You're correct. I apologize. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. That takes us now to the state's request for special jury instructions on causation, filed October 23, 2024. I have reviewed it and the proposed instruction on paragraph three therein. Judge, the, the reason we're bringing this up is just during the cross examination of Dr. Z, or Zadovich, um, you know, we poked the bear a little bit about his uh, cardiovascular uh, condition. <laughs> My memory of the testimony was that she's emphatic that that was not the cause of his death. Um, but because of that, and because of now the request of culpable negligence at misdemeanor for a lesser, um, I, I feel it might be warranted to give this uh, explanation of causation in the second degree murder um, and manslaughter instructions. Defense, what say you? Um, judge. I would object. I believe that just the instruction, the proposed instruction that I have it as one, but for the defendant's criminal act, which we have a standard jury instruction that said the death was caused by the criminal act of the defendant. That's what they're required to prove. This language, to me, was less than that requirement. By saying but for the defendant's criminal act. Then the second part, when it goes down to George Fuller's death, was not beyond the scope of any of any fair assessment of the danger created by the defendant's criminal act. I think that's covered, Judge, in the fact that the state does not have to prove that he that Miss Boone had the intent to kill George Torres. So that makes it makes it confusing to me when the standard instruction basically simplifies it in my mind and it keeps them right where they're supposed to be with that instruction. They don't have to prove that she had the intent. Then, as to the third part, I'll just throw my request for that. Okay. If heart disease gets brought up, we close them. All right, fine. So, withdrawn. Court takes no action on the state's request for special jury instruction on causation. That leaves us now with the state's request for forcible felony instruction and request for initial aggressor instruction. That's already been, That's already been addressed, has it not? I was just treating this as special jury instruction for my argument. Understood. All right, are there any other instructions sought by the state at this time? I believe we have concluded the session. Defense. No other one. All right, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take all this upstairs. I'm going to re-review it. I'm going to merge it all into one document, and I will send it to all the parties. Um, let's plan on being back here at 1.30, and we'll address any other concerns of the jury instructions at that point in time. State, anything else we need to address? Well, let's make it 120. All right. Thank you. All uh, right. Defense. Nothing else. All right. We'll see you all at 120. Thank you. We're back on the record. Case number 2020, CF 2603, State of Florida versus Sarah Boone. Let me get appearances for the state, please. Dave Ketchikor on behalf of the state. Bill James, the state. Defense. James Owens for Ms. Boone. Tony Anderson for Sarah Boone. Coming back over there. Ms. Boone is seated at council's table wearing the same clothing from this morning. I apologize for my lateness. I realized that there were some typos after I'd sent this to print and needed to take them all apart to fix it. So thank you for your patience as we work through that. State. We noticed that in the non deadly course. Page 12. There was a couple strike with the use. I saw. However, there was also a mistake with 
leaving a paragraph about reputation in at the very end of the 3.6G, and that should have been a mirror of the relative physical capabilities of the parties. I do see that. Um, other than that, I saw the he, she bracketed still. I fixed that on page 16. And then it's just that one, I think, that Mr. Henderson and I voted against. Okay, all right. Um, I can have Madam Clerk start fixing them here. Yeah, I think we should proceed um, and get, get going if we can. But they will have nothing in their hands. All right. Well, That's the issue. All right. That Sorry. All right. Thank you. Just give us a minute to fix all this. Yes. We found And just so that I'm clear back on the record, we're referring to the bottom of page 12, 3.6G, paragraph two, where the use is struck through, correct? Yes, sir. And then we're referring to the top of page 13 as to that two lines as to reputation. Is that correct? Yes, sir. That's the physical capability in paragraph four Give me a moment. Let me pull back up to the 3.6G instruction. So that reputation paragraph should be removed in its entirety and it should be the. Considering the issue of self protection may take into account the relative physical abilities and capacities of Sarah Boone and George Florida. There it is. Thank you. Take it. 10, 12, 13. Thank you. It is not letting me copy it over, and I don't know why. Correct. <coughs> Was there anything else other than that? Um, if you find George Torres had a reputation for being violent and dangerous person, you may consider this fact in determining whether he was the initial aggressor. Anything else that needs to be added to the jury instructions from the state side of the way? Well, the reputation should be believed. Correct. I agree with you. Yes. I'm sorry. What the heck is going on here? No reputation, Judge? That's correct. Mr. J, was there another line that we had added to the end of that? I don't believe so. The, the, the physical context sentence is where it should be. Okay. Maybe that's what I was making rough. Maybe that's what I was thinking of. So the Senate should read, in considering the issue of self-defense, you may take into account the relative physical capabilities, I'm sorry, physical cap 
abilities and capacities, Sarah Boone and George Torres. Is that correct? Yes. All right. Nice thank you. Correct. It matches 36F. Now, I apologize. Um, I'm going to have Madam Clerk, print, I'll email it to her now, have her print out pages 25 copies of 12 and 13, and we'll start taking apart our jury instructions and re adding them. And I thank you for your patience. 12 and 13, that's it. Mr. Jay, are you going to be utilizing the verdict form in closing? I am not. Mr. Owens, are you going to be utilizing the verdict form in closing? Mm -hmm. I may. Where is it going to be at your bed? Yeah. I'll ask you for it. Very good, sir. Thank you. Judge, you know. Can you get a chance? No, go ahead, sir. I can multitask. Uh, I know there's a mic here. I know there's a mic right here. I will confirm with court admin that that microphone is on. I believe it is. They turned it on during openings. I'll confirm now. And then judge, last time I used this uh, fingerprint table as my podium. That's fine. I may just slide it back so I'm... That's fine, sir. And then judge, I've got uh, two tripods. And I've got some demonstrative aids. One is this, uh, it was originally a quote by Dr. Michael Brand. Okay. Okay. May proceed. What are the other uh, enlargements, sir? It's a, uh, okay. it's the one I tried to get in. I hear no objection. Opening, which was the justifiable use okay. of non-deadly force. No objection. Those two. And then, okay. you remember, you remember my reasonable doubt? I was using it for. Have, you've seen them? Okay. I had no objection to those five. I didn't like the three charts. The defense agreed that the, we found a reasonable doubt charts they won't need. So I think we're all good on the charts. All right, very good. And the only other thing I'm going to use. But we're good with their demonstrative aids during, uh, during closings that we were used during trial. Okay, very good. So I've got two videos that I'm going to want to play. And Shelby Andrews is going to walk up. They're in evidence, right? Yeah. They are. Yep. Yeah. Okay. One of them has been pared down. That's fine. As long as it's in evidence, you can present whatever you'd like. Hey, Judge, I don't, do you want to talk about time for closing? We can. What do you think, State? You advised an hour and a half. Yeah, um, I think we both said an hour and a half, but as the court knows, you can't really uh, hold us to it until we get a little ridiculous. That's true. How much do you anticipate, sir? Well, Judge, she's charged with murder. We've had a two week trial. Um, I've got a lot to say, I've got a lot of notes. Good. Let's go. I'm, I'm not hearing any, you know, okay. the stammering thing, for the only thing clamoring from the state. After the state has has had their first opening, to give them a short Agreed. break, and then let me start. Agreed. We'll take our afternoon break at that point in time, then we can proceed with the defense closing and then rebuttal. Mm -hmm. I have received approval from the chief to work after nine o'clock, so we can go until about ten, maybe a little bit thereafter. And then so, you're saying with the jury. And correct. Then if 10 o'clock, if we hit some number 10 or 11, then when we come back Monday? That's correct. <clears throat>
State, are you ready to proceed? Yes, sir. Defense, are you ready to proceed? Okay. Yes, sir. State, do you recognize our jury? Yes, sir. Defense, do you recognize our jury? Yes. Everyone can be seated. Thank you. Members of the jury, thank you for your patience. Um, we had a long conversation about the jury instructions, and uh, I missed a typo or two after I had printed everything and uh, took us a while to print everything out. I'm going to ask the court and deputy to come forward and pass these out to you. If you could, if you can, please raise your hands to confirm that you complied with the court's instructions during the break. All right, record reflect all hands have been raised. Members of the jury, we are at the conclusion of the evidence and testimony. In this case, the court is now going to instruct you on the law. Courtroom deputy is providing you copies of the jury instructions. Like I said at the beginning, you're gonna be able to take these back with you into the deliberation room. There's not gonna be a quiz or a test at the end. You don't need to memorize anything. If you'd like to read along, you can. If you just wanna listen, you can. It's completely up to you. Court's gonna read most of the instructions and then turn it over to the lawyers for their closing arguments. The state will go first as they have the burden, then the defense will go, and then we, the state will have the opportunity to rebut. Then I will conclude the instructions and release you for your deliberations. After the state's closing, we're gonna take our afternoon recess. At that point in time, I'll have the courtroom deputy provide you that emergency number. So if you need to reach out and do family or loved ones to let them know that you were, are on the jury and are deliberating, you can do that at that time. With that, members of the jury, court's gonna go ahead and begin reading you the jury instructions. Instruction 3.1, introduction to final instructions. Members of the jury, I thank you for your attention during this trial. Please pay attention to the instructions I am about to give to you. 3.2, statement of the charge. Sarah Boone, the defendant in this case, has been accused of the crime of second degree murder. 7.1, introduction to homicide. Sarah Boone is accused of second degree murder. Murder in the second degree includes the lesser crime of manslaughter both of which are unlawful. However, a killing that was excusable or that was committed by the justifiable use of deadly force is lawful. If you find George Torres was killed by Sarah Boone, you will then consider the circumstances surrounding the killing and deciding if the killing was second degree murder or was manslaughter or whether the killing was excuse, excusable or resulted from result of justifiable use of deadly force. Justifiable homicide. The killing of a human being is justifiable homicide and lawful 
if necessarily done while resisting an attempt to murder or commit a felony upon the defendant or to commit a felony in any dwelling house in which the defendant was at the time of the killing. Excusable homicide. The killing of a human being is excusable and therefore lawful under any one of the following three circumstances. One, when the killing is committed by accident and misfortune in doing any lawful act by lawful means with usual ordinary caution and without any unlawful intent. Or two, when the killing occurs by accident and misfortune in the heat of passion upon any sudden and sufficient provocation. Or three, when the killing is committed by accident and misfortune resulting from a sudden combat, if a dangerous weapon is not used and the killing is not done in a cruel or unusual manner. A dangerous weapon is any object that will likely cause death or break great bodily harm if used in the ordinary and usual manner contemplated by its design and construction. Great bodily harm means great, as distinguished from slight, trivial, minor, or moderate harm, and does not, and as such, does not include mere bruises. I now instruct you on the circumstances that must be proved before Sarah Boone may be found guilty of second degree murder or any lesser included crime. 7.4 Murder, Second Degree. To prove the crime of second degree murder, the state must prove the following three elements beyond a reasonable doubt. One, George Torres is dead. Two, the death was caused by the criminal act of Sarah Boone. Three, there was an unlawful killing of George Torres by an act imminently dangerous to another and demonstrating a depraved mind without regard for human life. An act includes a series of related actions arising from and performed pursuant to a single design or purpose. An act is imminently dangerous to another and demonstrating a depraved mind if it is an act or series of acts that, one, a person of ordinary judgment would know is reasonably certain to kill or do serious bodily injury to another, and two, is done from ill will, hatred, spite, or an evil intent, and three, is of such a nature that the act itself indicates an indifference to human life. In order to convict of second degree murder, it is not necessary for the state to prove the defendant had an intent to cause death. 3.4, when there are lesser included crimes or attempts. In considering the evidence, you should consider the possibility that although the evidence may not convince you that the defendant committed the main crime of which she is charged, there may be evidence that she committed other acts that would constitute a lesser included crime or crimes. Therefore, if you decide that the main accusation has not been proved beyond a reasonable doubt, you will next need to decide if the defendant is guilty of any lesser included crime. The lesser crimes indicated in the definition of second degree murder is manslaughter, culpable negligence. 7.7, .7, manslaughter. To prove the crime of manslaughter, the state must prove the following two elements beyond a reasonable doubt. One, George Torres is dead. 2A, Sarah Boone intentionally committed an act or acts that caused the death of George Torres. B, the death of George Torres was caused by the culpable negligence of Sarah Boone. Yes. I apologize, or thank you for that clarification. Sarah Boone intent, I'll reread those for you, 2A, Sarah Boone intentionally committed an act or acts that caused the death of Sarah of George Torres, or B, the death of George Torres was caused by the culpable negligence 
of Sarah Boone. Every person has a duty to act reasonably towards others. If there is a violation of that duty without any conscious intent to harm, that violation is negligence. The defendant cannot be guilty of manslaughter by committing a merely negligent act or if the killing was either justifiable or excusable homicide, as I have previously instructed you. In order to convict of manslaughter by act, it is not necessary for the state to prove that the defendant had an intent to cause death, only an intent to commit an act that would do. Clearly, George Torres is the one calling the shots at 4748 France Lane. Ladies and gentlemen, are we so sure that George Torres wasn't the person suffering from battered spouse syndrome? Next, we're going to come to the justifiable use of non-deadly force. The language and the arguments are pretty close to what we've already heard in the deadly force instruction, including the key language that it requires a reasonably cautious and prudent person under the same circumstances would have believed that the use of non-deadly force was necessary. Ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you that this was not a case of non-deadly force. George Torres lost his life as a result of these actions. We have heard the testimony of Dr. Sarah Zadovich, who described his cause and manner of death, who described the mechanism of death, how that oxygen dissipated in that suitcase. And when we also look at the imminency, we heard in opening statements by Mr. Owens that, oh, the, the big threat in this case, the awful threat, was, was in the magic nine minutes between the video at 11.12 that she took, torturing George Torres, to her follow-up video at 11.23, after she had moved the, the suitcase. Mr. J, you publish from State 17, IMG 1063. <laughs> It was a short video. But what's one of the things that we notice by this point? You can hear how loud. George's voice is 
on the 11-12 video. But now, roughly 11 minutes later, from the time that that started, you see that the makeshift coffin that he's in has been moved. And his voice now is softer. The life is draining from George Torres, and it's evident in that video. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is evidence that there was no threat in the magic nine minutes that was not recorded. There was only George Torres in this box, slowly being killed. Next, we come to weighing the evidence. This instruction tells us it is up to you to decide what evidence is reliable. You should use your common sense in deciding which is the best evidence and which evidence should not be relied upon in considering your verdict. You may find some of the evidence not reliable or less reliable than other evidence. You should consider how the witness acted as well as what they said. Some things you should consider Did the witness have an opportunity to see and know the things about which the witness testified? In focusing on the defendant, absolutely. Two people walk through the front door on the evening of February 23rd, 2020, at 4748 France Court. George Torres and Sarah Boone. But only Sarah Boone ever walked out of that front door alive. Did the witness seem to have an accurate memory? This is an emphatic no. And the litany of her intoxication in versions of events is evidence of that. Was the witness honest and straightforward in answering the attorney's questions? I would submit to you she wasn't. Four, did the witness have some case, some interest in how the case should be decided? Clearly, does the witness's testimony agree with the other testimony and other evidence in the case? And I would say largely no. Because on the issue of whether or not George Torres could have threatened her the way she says that he did, the answer is clearly no, and we know that from the forensic data. We know that from the items itself. Did the witness at some other time make a statement that is inconsistent with the testimony he or she gave in court? In regards to the defendant, 
It's almost more appropriate to ask about the time she did make a consistent statement. You listen to her version of events on the 911 call, on the body cameras, on her first interviews with law enforcement, and then you hear her in her next interview the next day with Detective Popsel and Detective Lowen, and more details come out. Things change. First, she was never intoxicated. Then she was intoxicated. Then there's just the whole fact of she omits the fact of, oh, yeah, he was actually trying to attack me. Oh, yeah, I was in fear for my life. When she said at every turn, no, it was just a great day. We were having fun. Oh, my God. I can't believe this. We were doing good. The only stress we had was about jobs. And now, four and a half years after the fact, it's time to come up with a new story. But ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you that the truth does not change. The facts do not change. The videos do not change. And on any version of events that the defendant has given, they all add up to the fact that there is absolutely no doubt that she is guilty of murder. I ask you, ladies and gentlemen, do you have any doubt about the defendant's guilt when she described using that baseball bat to hit George Torres's fingers back in the suitcase when he attempted to save his life? Do you have any doubt when she is given how many versions of events in this case? Do you have any doubt after hearing the testimony of her neighbors about the loud crash and the arguing that night? Do you have any doubt after hearing the testimony of Dr. Sarah Zadovich? Do you have any doubt after watching the videos of George Torres being murdered and her laughing about it and talking about the fact that he cheated on her. Do you have any doubt after reading the text messages from her phone, after seeing the videos of how she controlled and manipulated George Torres? And if you say, Mr. Cacciatore, I still have a doubt. Well, then the law asks you, is that doubt to an element? And is that doubt a mere possible doubt, a speculative an imaginary or a forced doubt. I submit to you the idea that she had to do this because she was a battered spouse is an imaginary doubt. It's an, a doubt born from the imagination of Sarah Boone. It is not a reasonable doubt. But if you find yourself back in that deliberation room, and you are just trying to think of some way 
some way in which the defendant is not guilty. Just searching, struggling for that way. That also is not a reasonable doubt, ladies and gentlemen. That is a forced doubt. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm confident that when you read the entirety of those jury instructions and apply the law to the facts that came out in this case, that you are going to come back with the only lawful verdict, which is guilty as charged, second degree murder. Thank you. Members of the jury, it is 4.04. As I promised, we were going to take that afternoon break before the defense proceeds with their closing argument. You're going to leave everything behind. Similar instruction that I've given you before. Please don't conduct any independent investigation, research as to the person, places, thing, or charge involved in this case. Do not have any discussions among yourselves or anyone else. We'll bring it back in in about 15 minutes. Thank you very much. All rise. Y'all may be seated. Thank you. Okay, may proceed. Sarah Boone's entitled to a fair trial. I think uh, that right's been compromised here today. Um, I, don't, I don't know who's scheduled to put two detectives on the front row with the Torres family, the family of the victim. But they had to have known to tell them that the suitcase video, which has been around for four and a half years, was going to be played during opening statements. And the state attorney's office or the sheriff's department had to advise them, or the victim's advocate had to advise them that if they couldn't take it in front of a jury that's trying to decide the case, they needed to get out of the courtroom. Now, what happened here today should not ever happen. There should be safeguards in place there's no room for this after two weeks of murder trial for something like that to happen. One of the Torres members of the family audibly during the two minute suitcase video expressed some kind of emotional reaction. I look back, she was he or she were bent over in agony, physical pain. The physical pain followed the audible announcement. You can't unring that bell. That's their responsibility to ensure that kind of thing doesn't happen, especially when they know they're going to show a video and the family of the victim is on the front row. I've never heard of such. I asked for a misdrop. Response. I've never heard of such a request. Um, the victim's family has the right to be here. They were advised as to what would be used during closing arguments. I cannot make a decision for the victim's family and the homicide survivors as to whether or not they believe they can handle it. She clearly, or he, I don't know, couldn't, and I believe the appropriate thing was done, they left the court. Um, but again, to, to say this is a potential sabotage and all the accusations that continuously get made are unsubstantiated. And it does not warrant a mistrial. People get warned, and sometimes they misjudge their own emotions. I don't understand what test we are expected to run on homicide survivors. So the motion should be denied. Motion's denied. Jury's going to be back in in about 13 minutes, counsel. So we'll reconvene at that point in time. Could the state put the suitcase back in the morning? Yeah, can we clean the, the well from the state's materials, please? Thank you.
we are back on the record 2020 CF 2603, State of Florida versus Sarah Boone. State appearances for the record. Steve Kestrong, behalf of the state. William J. for the Florida State of Florida. James Owens for Sarah Boone. Yeah, we're back on behalf of Sarah Boone. Tony Henderson, Sarah Boone. Ms. Boone is still seated at council's table wearing the same clothing from this morning. Are we ready to bring in our jury for the defense closing at this time? State. Yes, defense. Judge, I would like you to give the audience an instruction and then um, if, if you would instruct the state attorney to instruct whatever family members or friends of George Torres may not be in here and may not be able to hear the instruction, but may come in during the trial so that we can try. Are there any other um, uh, members of Mr. Torres's family that may be outside that may be joining us? Okay. All right. So she's left. She's no longer here. Okay. That's what I just asked. Is there anyone outside? Okay. Okay. All right. So um, members of our gallery, good afternoon. I'm going to please ask you to please contain yourself and not to have any emotional outbursts. We had a minor one and the person, whoever it was, had a small outburst, then hid next to another family member and then excused herself during the last absent or during, uh, during the closing. It seemed to be minor in nature. However, I'm advising everyone that at this time, if you believe that you cannot control yourself or your emotional responses during the defense's closing argument or any rebuttal by the state, I'm going to politely ask you to excuse yourselves at this time. All right. Thank you very much. Mr. Owens, anything else, sir? No, sir. All right, state. We're ready. All right. Let's bring back in our panel. Making their selections. Okay, thank you. All can be seated. They're making their dinner selections. We'll just give them a couple minutes to do that. Thank you. Okay. I was just about, I don't know if that's, if that is allowed by the court or anything. Been allowed since I started practicing in 1999. If, if you want to split up your closing between the two of y'all, that's fine by me. Well, I, I intended on doing the closing, but when I finish, Mr. Henderson wants to say something. Um, I may ask you to. I've never seen it done that way. I've understood the sandwich can be broken. I've never ever seen a single closing argument split by another attorney. If, uh, if it's a discretionary issue, I'll leave it up to you, sir, on what you want to do on how you want to present your closing. Object during rebuttal. It's reasonable. Who would be objecting during rebuttal? Mr. Owens. Okay, there you go. <clears throat> Mr. 
State, you recognize our jury? Yes, Your Honor. Defense, do you recognize our jury? Thank you. Y'all may be seated. Number three, for one of the last times, if you could please raise your hands to confirm that you complied with the court's instructions. All hands have been raised. Members of the jury, at this time, the defense is going to proceed with their closing argument, similar to the state's closing argument. Uh, these are not evidence. These are just arguments, and I ask you to pay attention to them. Thank you. Mr. Owens, you may proceed, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Y'all know me, I'm James Owens, along with Tony Henderson and the girls. We're all from Milton. I, I think y'all figured that out, that we were from out of town. Santa Rosa County, it's uh, Northwest Florida, close to Pensacola. And my buddy Kevin Beck, he's a long-time friend, he's from New Mexico. Um, the team, the defense team, uh, is here, and uh, we're here to represent Miss Sarah Bell. And we feel confident that uh, we're going to be able to show you why she's not dead. Okay? And I'm going to take my time. I've got some notes. I'm not the most organized person in the world. I've got some exhibits that we're going to show you. And then we got a couple of videos at the end, okay? And uh, we're going to try our best to help you make the right decision, okay? But yeah, Milton's a small town. Objection. Problems. Overruled. See how small it is. Seven miles away is another small town called Pace. In between that is a Walmart. Very small town. We didn't know what to expect. Coming down as your tournament. Judge, I'm allowed to I'll give you a, I'll give you a little bit more for intro, but then we need to get into it. I, I'm gonna get into it. I, I wanted to say it's a small town, good people. We've been down here three weeks. We didn't know what to expect. We've been surprised. From Objection. In power argument. Mr. Owens, approach. Objections overruled. All, all I wanted to say is just since we've been here, we've been treated with respect and hospitality. And just like we've been at home, we appreciate that. Now, um, I'm going to do some reading and then I'm going to do some talking. But <clears throat> ultimately, this is about uh, justifiable use of force. That is a legal defense in Florida. We as citizens, um, the law is designed to protect us from defending ourselves, to protect us from a potential attack. And you are the only ones, in this case, because Sarah Ben was arrested, that's going to be able to look at it critically and objectively. Objectively. I like the state attorney. Objection to the proper argument. Overruled. Objectively. And the law in Florida gives you all the power and authority to do that. The state attorney can't make the decision. They can't make the decision. They can try to influence you. And we're going to talk about some of the things they did here in this trial. And some of the things they said. Objection. Yes. You may proceed. Objections overruled. <clears throat> Thank you, Judge. They've got their side, their position, we've got our side. So we're going to talk about that. But, um, and we're going to talk about justifiable use of deadly force and non deadly force. But either way, however you rule, it still justifies her behavior. Um, and the result is not. Good. Now, I don't believe there's anybody. Objection. Proper argument. 
Overruled. Yes. I think you will find from considering the evidence in this case that there is no doubt that Sarah Boone is a victim. That Sarah Boone has been traumatized. That Sarah Boone is still traumatized. And the reason for the trauma is George Torres. The reason for the trauma is George Torres. From the positive things about the man that we've seen on video to the positive things Sarah Boone has testified about, to the violent monster he becomes. And I mean monster because it was repeatedly And what happens the next day? Man, I won't remember. I was drunk. I don't remember. That's the gaslighting. That this young woman, vulnerable woman, with nobody, just starving for love, starving for attention, and seeing the good in the man. And it was good. But every day was on the balance. She measured every day, depending on how it started and then how it ended. And that's the way she had to live her life, day in and day out, day in and day out. Dr. Harper and Dr. Brandon talked about trauma. Dr. Harper spoke of the veterans that she had treated for post-traumatic stress disorder. I don't know if you remember her testimony, but she spoke about some of the veterans that had been in the war in Iraq. You know, and, and people in war a lot of times get post-traumatic stress. It used to be called shell shock and other things. But people in wartime or police officers, police officers will get post-traumatic stress. And a lot of them come in, the males come in with this bravado, oh, I'm all right. I'm all right. And so that's why Dr. Harper was talking about the veterans. That's what they'll do. But you've got to spend time with them. You got it just can't be one session. And you've got to run post-traumatic stress testing, which tells whether they really have post-traumatic stress. And we all probably have experienced some trauma. All of us have lost some loved ones. And and it's it's awful. You're in shock. You can't believe it. It's disbelief. You don't sleep for days. And eventually, you have to go back to work. You take a week off. Life has to go on. Life has to go on. You go back to work. Kids are in school. You get a little time. Right? Time heals. Right? These veterans that come back from a deployment, they get back, they get some semblance of normalcy, they may or may not get some treatment, but time helps. Time heals. Everybody, it helps. Just time. Overcoming a divorce, 
overcoming a death, whatever trauma. Sarah Boone had no break. No break. Learned helplessness. Just given up. Just given up. I can't, I can't get out of this situation. They broke up. She go about two days. She go about two days. Vaccine calling. Just learned helplessness. And it's, you know, in the, the manual. That her spouse syndrome is not. But what did you hear Dr. Harper say? She suffers from post-traumatic stress. That is a mental disorder. You are actually undergoing the psychological effects of post-traumatic stress. You're not in your right mind. And it's repeating itself. It's repeating itself again and again, day in and day out. And when you look at this law, that's what you have to apply. Someone in Sarah Boone's shoes when you're deciding whether her conduct was reasonable. Got a bunch of notes. Something that was something I wanted to read. Sarah Boone's long-term exposure to abuse created a state of learned helplessness and diminished her capacity to assess risk, especially in moments of heightened stress. The cyclical nature of this violence, the tension building, the battering, the contrition phases, caused Sarah to be trapped psychologically in that relationship. Due to this clear abuse, Sarah Boone had a reasonable belief of imminent harm under her state of mind. George Torres had a history of violence against Sarah, and as a result, Sarah Boone's actions were the result of fear conditioned by abuse she endured over time. The cumulative effects of long-term abuse, as we saw her behavior on the two-minute suitcase video, is a trauma response. Sarah Boone acted out of a sense of preservation. While tragic, it was not driven by malice, but a mind ravaged by abuse. And I'm going to ask you to try to understand. Try to understand. Sarah Boone being emotionally and psychologically broken. These actions may have been misguided attempts at survival, but not murder. Imminent danger, her response reacted to that belief. It's, it's somebody suffering from the long-term psychological effects of domestic violence. Who spent a lot of time? Dr. Brain, you remember him. He was the first expert on trauma. Took some notes. Kevin Beck, you remember, did the direct examination of Dr. Brandon. He was from down in Miami, I think. He talked about the trauma that you can't you cannot escape from, from the abuse, so you develop coping skills to protect yourself, knowing that the bad things will happen to me. It changes your behavior, not only your behavior, but your thinking. Your subjective thinking about fear and what to do. 
And if you remember, Dr. Brandon said it's all about that person's perception. Okay? A lot of times they will self-medicate with alcohol or drugs. A lot of times they suffer from anxiety. Basically, he said the trauma ends up being terror because you do not know what to expect. You do not know what is going to happen that night. It may be a great night. You may drink, and both of you have a great time. He falls asleep, passes out, you fall asleep, passes out. But it may turn by, depending on his mood, I don't know if you can tell, she would try to placate him. Um, Dr. Brandon said, you know, when you're trying to evaluate somebody, it takes time to get them to trust you. And ultimate, the ultimate goal, he said, is to be a behavioral detective, if you're a forensic uh, psychologist, is to be a uh, behavioral detective. And the ultimate goal is to put yourself in the abused person's eyes so you can better understand their world. But ultimately, it's their perception of danger. Their perception of danger is what you have to look at. What a reasonable person would do under their perception of danger. Now, I want to go on. Trauma experts explain how victims' reactions to in moments of stress are the product of the damaged psyche. Her actions, although tragic, and it was a tragedy, George Torres lost his life in that suitcase. It's a reactionary response to sustained trauma. It's, it's as if Sarah was acting out of a deeply ingrained fear and helplessness de developed over the years. So it's, it's a desperate, desperate need for survival, but battered women do things to keep the peace from time to time. And when they feel like they have a small portion of momentary power, they may enjoy that by vocalizing their position to the abuser. Sarah Boone's not perfect. Sarah Boone would argue with him, talk down to him. Some would say was somewhat abusive to him. Sarah's not charged with that. Sarah Boone is not charged with that. And I want to I want to read you something on that subject. Essentially. Yeah, I don't, I don't know where it's at, but I'm going to have to come back to it. But essentially what it said was, essentially what it said was eventually, Two week trial, I've had a bunch of notes. Trying to get this right. I know, I know it's important. Um, what I wanted to say was someone can be mean and angry and hateful, and intoxicated, and still be abused. They're not mutually exclusive. And mutual abuse exists where one is abusive towards another. And eventually, the victim, Sarah Boone, Trying to fight back against the abuse became verbally abusive. While the victim has committed verbal abuse, it is important to remember that they, Sarah Boone, are the victim and have been pulled into an extremely vicious cycle where they are trying to survive. Okay. 
Sarah Boone intentionally left George Torres in the suitcase. What's the, what's the act of a battered spouse syndrome woman? She went up to her room. She fell asleep and passed out. These actions are disconnected. Ultimately, she didn't let him out because of her fear that she knew if he got out in that moment, what he would do. That's real fear. That's real trauma that she was experiencing at that time. Now, I talked to you about force being used. And I talked to, I think I talked to you about uh, blocking an attack uh, using a physical restraint like the suitcase to block somebody's attack. And the example I give, I've got a couple of examples that may or may not apply. Let's say you're in a bar and you've got your buddies and the other guy's got the buddies and they're drinking and there's, there ends up being an argument between two of them. And you realize that these two are fixing to get in it. Well, one of your buddies comes around on the other side and grabs the guy before he's able to strike you, right? So you're committing an offense on this guy, but it's a, it's a restraint. It's a restraint. Or you grab him by the neck and try to get him out the bar. So, yeah, you're committing an act, but it's designed to defend another, which is legal. Or let's say you have a situation where you have a police officer and he's on patrol. You know, he's in uniform, he's wearing a firearm, and of course he's got the bulletproof vest. And he's called, he's, he goes to a call where there's a suspect that may be armed. A suspect that may be armed. And so he gets there, he gets out of the squad car, he's walking around, of course he's taking out his gun because he realized he may be armed. And eventually he sees the suspect, and the suspect reaches for his waist. Now, in that moment in time, that officer has to make a decision. Am I going home with my family tonight? And I, I asked Dr. Warner about this Vaseline bas thing he's called it. Fear response or fight or flight. You know, those decisions are made, it, it's instinctive based on your set of six circumstances. She instinctively reacted to her unique set of circumstances to save her life or save herself from another one of these. I'm 63. can't imagine that. I can't imagine that. Her father's not around. I need to talk about the case for And if you remember, I'll get back. I'll get back. If you remember, um, <coughs> also place here. Let's start, let's start with the witnesses, and then I'll talk about Sid. But the first witness out of the box for the state, if you remember, was Juan Torres, the brother. Remember that? It was, it was some time ago. No, it's been a while. Y'all taking notes. You may have to go back. Their first witness was a good witness for us. Their first witness in their prosecution of Sarah Boone for murder was a good witness for us. Remember Tony Henderson with the cross examine of Juan Torres. Asked him, what did you hear Sarah Boone say? 
Juan Torres, she was yelling, he's been choking me. He's been choking me. Mr. Henderson said, did that surprise you? Juan Torres said, no. That family knew what was going on. The police knew what was going on. The neighbors knew what was going on. Pearl Walker came in here, 80 something years old, in a wheelchair. Kevin Beck called her up. She saw it. Is there any doubt? Is there any doubt? I tell you why there's no doubt. In cross-examination, I got Dr. Warner to even admit. Did you hear it? Yes? Okay, Mr. Owen. She suffers from battered spouse syndrome. Wouldn't admit it on direct. Well, maybe I don't, I don't really know. I haven't had enough time to really see her. You hadn't seen the pictures? You hadn't seen the two-minute video? You've seen it one time? Earlier this month, one time, and she's going to start testifying about stuff she's never said before until she showed up in court, about, well, based on what she told me, I don't think she was in intimate fear. Come on. This is a courtroom. This is a courtroom. Good thing y'all are here. We thank you. But it, it gets even worse than that. It gets even worse than that here in this courtroom. The state attorney referred to these pictures. That I was, was going to rise up yeah. over, and show these pictures to you. Overall, you may proceed. That I was going to rise up and show these pictures to you. Well, yeah, I'm going to do that. They put her on trial for murder. But what did they say? And I got to turn to this, make sure I get this exactly like they said. I took a bunch of notes. Let me make sure I got this quote. Can't even find it. But it was something to the effect maybe George Torres is the battered spouse. Can you believe it? Can you believe that? Now you know why we're here. Now you know why we're here. Little boys learn early on. That girls are different. You do not put your hands on a girl. You can't wrestle with them. You can't punch them. You can't kick them. You can't treat women that way. When you become adults, I don't care what she does to you. I don't care what she says to you. If she gets in your face... Whatever she does, you do not have a right to hit a woman. No, sir.
What has the state attorney tried to do? Protection, sustain. What has they done? Protection. What evidence have they? What evidence have they tried to put on? Overruled. What evidence have they tried to paint Sarah? Sarah's. What evidence? Controlled and manipulated were the words they used. <clears throat> you know, this ain't the 1900s, this is 2024. What's all these text messages? Why is that relevant? What are they trying to claim? She provoked his violence? She provoked his violence. Isn't that what they've done here in this trial? Sustained. We'll get back on this. Abraham Marino. I don't know if you remember him. Abraham Marino changed his statement. They took a statement from Abraham Marino in which Sarah stated, I don't know if you remember, but it was when the police were all there. Uh, I think they got the tape out and, and some neighbors were coming around. And there were two or three neighbors sitting around. She, he said, Sarah came out and stated it was an accident. Okay. Well, then it was an accident. This uh, Abraham Marino knew uh, George Torres from Philly. Okay. They were friends. They would talk either at the complex or if Marino went to Paul Day Hardware or Ace Hardware, what it's called. The state attorney notifies. Okay. I'm going to object to reading from things that are not in evidence. Approach. You may proceed. So for four and a half years, Marino says, all I heard Sarah say that afternoon was it was an accident. And then he came in here today, or this week and said, no, she said I was teaching him a lesson, things got out of hand, and then I fell asleep. Four and a half years later, we know he's friends with the toilet. We heard it here. Now, I want to talk to you about the, uh, the two boys that live right next door. Um, you remember um, Vincent, Vincent Battaglia and um, Brandon Motes. Remember those guys? And you remember it came out in the testimony, you know, this event happened on February 23rd of 2020. But it came out in the testimony that Sarah had said, George Torres, the night before, February 22nd of 2020, grabbed me by my hair and pulled me down the, sta the stairs in my apartment from top to bottom, which is consistent with what they were saying happened, remember? But they got their dates wrong. And remember, Mr. Henderson called Deputy Copsel or Detective Copsel up in our case, and she had to say, yeah, I didn't take their two statements until the 27th, February the 27th, remember? So they're remembering back, and they both had similar stories. Of course, they had time to talk by then, the 27th. I think the only recorded interviews they got that the night of this event, February 23rd, was from 
Sarah Boone and her ex-husband, Brian Boone, right? So they came back following up on the 27th. That's when they got a, a statement from Brandon Motes and Vincent Metagna. And at that time, they said, yeah, we heard that sound. You remember Sarah testifying, you know? That was the night before. I had complained about that, and I think one of them had testified. Yes, she had said something about being drugged down the night before. It may have been, um, I can't remember now who it was, one of them. And, you know, it looked like that there may be some implication that Sarah got him in the suitcase and pushed him down the street. But I think we didn't hear anything before that. Remember? And then this photograph, which we introduced, which shows the bottom of the stairs, as you can see, there's uh, Lucas's bookshelf, right? This is where Sarah stored, Sarah Ben stored Lucas's stuff. And you can see it's not disturbing at all. <clears throat> anyway, I want to get back to Sarah. I want to talk a little bit about that. But let me talk a little bit about the law. Unjustifiable use of force is legal and lawful if you reasonably believe. I think we all probably all already understand it by now. You reasonably believe it was necessary to prevent imminent threat to harm. The law is crucial. Ensuring that individuals can safeguard themselves in potentially dangerous situations. By acknowledging you have a right to defend yourself when you have a reasonable belief that force is necessary to prevent an attack. Okay? What did Mr. Henderson say in jury selection? You don't have to wait. You do not have to wait. If you're facing, in your mind, a reasonable, imminent threat, you don't have to wait. Let's talk about Sarah Boone. And this unconventional form of physical restraint to block the attack of George Torres. What did she say? It's all, it's all okay. Now, you got to think about that. You got to think about what was going on. You got to think about the trauma she was undergoing. You got to think about they both been drinking. And you got to think about the fact that it was small fun and games for a while. And I think the biggest thing to know is that George Torres chose to get in the system. He's a grown man. That was his choice. She didn't force him in at gunpoint. To get into that suitcase. He voluntarily got into that suitcase because they were drunk and being silly and stupid and playing hide and seek. Which I guess when you get so drunk, that, that seemed like a good thing. Zipped him up, they're laughing, carrying on. And as you know, Sarah likes to videotape a lot. And I know you've seen some of these videos and you're wondering why, but I think the evidence shows that when George is being videotaped, he's not going to do anything. If you think about that, when George is being videotaped, that's like her power. You know, um, Dr. Harper said that uh, Sarah's words are her power. Sarah's words are her power. Physically, Physically, she's no match for George. Physically, she's no match. But that's her power. So much. When she gets a chance, when she gets a chance to have some control, that's what she does. And she videotapes because she knows when she's videotaping, she can tell it like it is. I can tell him what I want to tell him. A couple of these videos you've seen. Well, she's telling him like it is. But she's got that video camera on, and George knows. He's being videoed. 
We've got one that we're going to show you a little bit. Or he loses it just a little bit. I did. I did. And then of course, we got the TV. But they're kidding around, playing around. Then, you know, Sarah realizes, okay, this is my chance to say something to her. So she sits down, she turns on the phone, and you've seen the tape. You've seen the tape. For everything you've done to me are the first words out of Sarah's mouth when the video begins. There's a lot packed into those words. Think about that. For everything you've done to me. This is how it feels when you choke me. Now that's that's in direct response. And the result of the abuse that she has suffered at the hands of George Storm. She wants him for that moment to feel how she feels. She wants for that moment to feel, for him to feel how she feels, how uncomfortable, lack of control that she feels when George is violent with her. Just for a moment, she won't be able to feel And if you can imagine, she, approach. I think from the evidence, you can determine she, she was crazy. She was crazy. And I don't know if, you know, of course, it's a syndrome. But she felt like she couldn't do it out. And let's say she videotapes it. And then it's turned off. And there's a nine-minute gap, 11-minute gap, whatever it is. I said 11, they're saying nine, but I think if you count two of the other ones, that's not. But there's nine minutes that we don't have video. But what did Sarah say? Now, if you remember when you listen on that video, George is talking in a normal voice. He's not stressed. Of course, if you're talking, you can breathe. She had said she had some air. And of course, she doesn't realize the situation, that it's going to end the way it ends. So she has no appreciation of, of that. It's a canvas, it's an all, she knows, an old canvas suitcase that she's got some, uh, the two zippers removed, or spread out a little bit, so he can burn. So she thinks he's not being serious. But eventually he gets angry. She gets angry, he gets angry, he sends words to her, and then his hand starts to come out of the suitcase. She also said his tone changed. And I know everybody's got a cadence with their spouse or boyfriend, girlfriend, but you know what I'm talking about. We've got a way of talking to people. Uh, we've got a way, your wife, your husband, you just you know each other. You know, when they come in from work, what kind of mood they're in. Just by a couple of things the way you just sense it, right? Well, especially somebody as hypervigilant as Sarah and as hypervigilant as a battered spouse woman would realize that he can flip the switch at any time. When I get out of here, I'm going to end you. And he realizes he's getting out. He got his hand out. At that moment in time, in Sarah's mind, that's an imminent threat. So she's got a justifiable right to use force. What did she do? She went over there and grabbed it. She lifted it up. She tried to get his hand back in. Remember? She tried to get his hand to go back in. Wouldn't go back in. So it's, her son's back was three feet away. Where the police found it the next morning. Same spot. No attempts to hide. No attempts to delete the phone. No attempts to tamper with evidence. Nothing. 
in the same spot as it was. She picks up the bat, she pokes. And she pokes him hard, trying to get him to stop trying to get out. And eventually he does. And you've seen the blunt force injuries. And you saw some of the circular injuries where you can tell there's a poking that gets right around here. And she poked him several times. Remember the pathologist said, I think, maybe five, six, or seven times. She pokes him. And he's got some scratches. I don't know if they'll let you look at it, but uh, on the back of that suitcase, it's got some bars, some metal bars that are, that are inside the lining. There's some lining. Uh, and it's for support when you walk in there. She testified. You heard what she said, that she was justified. That's uncontroverted testimony. Now, let's, let's talk about the jury instructions just for a minute. I want to talk, I want to talk about reasonable doubt for a minute. Um, yeah, on the page, but I, I've got to go. I've got to go. Be fine. Y'all looking. I think it's on page 15 or 22. So we're going to talk about these without a minute, but if you look at those bottom three short paragraphs, it is the evidence introduced in this trial and the it alone that you are to look for the evidence or look for that proof. A reasonable doubt of, as to the guilt of the defendant may arise from the evidence itself, a conflict in the evidence, or lack of evidence. But here's the main thing. And, you know, obviously, I represent her, and I'm trying my best to show you honestly and fairly the doubt in this case. And five reasonable doubts, 17 reasonable doubts, 25 reasonable doubts. You have to have one reasonable doubt. I'm trying to show you throughout the evidence that each one of you can have a different reasonable doubt, a different but one reasonable doubt about the state's case and your verdict is not guilty, according to the law. Proof beyond a reasonable doubt does not mean proof beyond all doubt. A reasonable doubt is not a mere possible doubt, speculative doubt, or imaginary or forced doubt. Such a doubt must not influence you to return a verdict for not guilty if you have an abiding conviction of guilt. And this is a deeply held belief. Or Reasonable doubt is the highest standard we recognize in litigation. You know, car wreck or something like that is preponderance of the evidence standard, 51% your entire. Abiding conviction. That's a deeply held belief that you must have if you're thinking about something. That's a firm belief. That's a level of certainty that you would have. That's what you got to have as a jury. I've got to be certain of her guilt. If on the other hand, if after carefully considering, comparing, and weighing all the evidence, which we want you to do, there is not an abiding conviction of guilt. So I'm not certain. I'm not certain of the guilt. Or if you have a conviction, I think there's some evidence of guilt, but it is one that is not stable, one which wavers and vacillates. One which wavers and vacillates then the charge is not proved beyond a reasonable doubt, and you should find the defendant not guilty because the doubt is reasonable. You understand that? You've got to be certain of guilt. That's the high standard we've recognized. If you've got, I've got some evidence of guilt, so okay, there's some evidence for conviction, but it's not way, it, it's not stable. It wavers and vacillates. Then under our system, you've got a reasonable doubt. And you've, you've got the power of authority. 
and the obligation under the law, if that's the way you feel, to vote that way. Later in the instruction, it goes on. It's up to you to decide what evidence is reliable. You should use your common sense in deciding which is the best evidence and which evidence should not be relied upon <laughs> considering your verdict. You may find some of the evidence not reliable or less reliable than other evidence. You may rely on your own conclusion about the credibility of a witness. That is totally the province of the jury to decide. The jury may believe or disbelieve any or all the part of the evidence of the testimony of any witness. I want, I want to show you this before I begin. But Dr. Warner said, this is their expert again. He testified that Sarah Boone suffers from Batistock syndrome. Battered women's experiences affect her perception of imminent danger. Those past experiences with George Torres, those past experiences with George Torres, and there's a bunch affect their perception. Remember Dr. Brandon, uh, Michael Brandon talked about perception of imminent danger. Victims of repeat violence may fear death in situations others would not. The reason Sarah experiences all this, the reason she was feeling the way she was feeling, that imminent threat of danger from George was because of George Torres. George Torres is responsible for her mental state because of the way he has violently treated her. She reacted to his attempts to get out because of the way he treated her and the way he, she knows he, what is he going to do if he gets out of the suitcase? She knows. The second video is played. She flipped it back upside right. You hear him, it's 22 seconds. He says, Sarah, she's not going to open that suitcase. She's not going to open that suitcase. He's already threatened her. She used the bat to get him to stop trying to get out of it. Why would she do that? Why would she do that? I know what he's going to do. I know what he's going to do to me. I know him like I know more. I know him more than he knows himself. I know what he's going to do to me. You don't have to wait. That was justifiable. Now, you got to understand this. She intentionally used the bat to defend herself. She intentionally didn't unzip him to defend herself. Both of those are lawful under our law. She went upstairs. The dogs were upstairs. At some point, she called her husband, her ex-husband, Brian Boone. We know that many times... She testified, or somebody, somebody in court said she she would often flee to her ex-husband's house sometime. I believe that testimony came out. And maybe Sarah or somebody. That she, sometimes she would flee, or sometimes she would flee to upstairs. One of those two. But the dogs were up there. She made a phone call. At some point, she fell asleep, passed out, fell asleep. We don't know. They had two big bottles of wine. Right? That was unintentional. That was unintentional. His death was unintentional. You remember when she was in the interrogation room? You remember that? Now, I don't know if we did a good job of this, but it came out that she got arrested. You remember the one time when she got the black eye? 
she got arrested for strangulation. And you, you remember that it was they ended up over there by the dryer, and he was banging her back of her head on the on the floor that had very little carpet on it, and she ended up getting getting her arms out, and then she grabbed his neck, and she eventually got him off of her, and that's when he got up and stomped her in the eye. Remember? Well, the police came for that event and they took statement and Sarah, Sarah was honest with the officers about what all, and they arrested her. You remember? Remember that? They arrested her. And she said, why? I was fighting back. You remember that? Why? I was fighting back. So from that point on, she didn't trust law enforcement. The video that they showed a while ago about George, that was about dropping the case where she, she was defending herself and fighting back. I want to talk about this investigation by law enforcement. Now, she didn't know the law. She's not a lawyer. She gets up the next morning. Brian's calling. Sarah's got to pick up Lucas at three. Brian's calling, Brian's calling, Brian's calling. Eventually, she walks down. She's looking for George. Where's George? He's quiet down there. Then she looks in the bathroom. She looks out. He's smoking a cigarette. He's on the computer. She sees the suitcase. And you can imagine. Injection. Sustained. She sees him in a suitcase. She can't. What does she do? What does she do? She tries to get her fiance out of the suitcase. They're engaged to be married. She's not trying to kill him. They're engaged to be married. She gets him out. She tries to do, he's purple. She tries her best to do CPR. She doesn't, you heard her. I don't know what, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know, call Brian. That's all, that's her safety valve. That's all she's got. Brian eventually says she's come over. He calls, she calls again in two minutes. I'm on the way. He gets there. You got to call 911. They have told her before. Call 911. She calls 911. She tries to do CPR again. Is she busy trying to hide evidence? Is she busy trying to hide evidence? Is she busy trying to hide the back? No. She's trying to save his life. If she can. So the police get there. She knows if she told them she fought back, she's going to be arrested. That's what happened before. What happened before? Like George just said on the video, she'd never been arrested before. Before that time, she was charged with that with George. She lies. She lies. She's scared. She's scared. She doesn't know what to do. So she lies. She makes a decision to lie. Don't trust law enforcement. She doesn't know the law. She doesn't call a lawyer. She talked to Officer Rodriguez, who was the first person. The short black female came up here first. The first one that arrived from the body cam talks to her. There's a report statement there where she doesn't tell the whole story. She lies. And then the detectives eventually get there and get her in the squad car. You hear the audio. I think, I think it was played. She lies again. Then the next day, she goes down to the sheriff's department. Now, if they would have told her, hey, ma'am, we're going to arrest you. And she gets a lawyer to go down there. 
to make a statement. And the Lord, you advise her. Objection. Sustained. Move strike. Stricken. The jury will pay no mention or give any weight to that statement. She's not a lawyer. She didn't have a lawyer present when she made this statement. She didn't know the law. She didn't know she was justified in defending herself the way she did in this dysfunctional, toxic, abusive relationship. <clears throat> If you remember, it was a two hour video, but there were some things she said, you know, not intentional. And eventually, she warned the, um, the detective, it was Detective Lowen, the male, the male detective. And she said, I, I swear to you on my son's life, it was not intentional. What she was talking about was that George passed, was that George died. That was not intentional. She thought he was fine in there. Would he sober up? We've learned from their history, when Sarah gets drunk, she calls for help. When George gets drunk, he beats Sarah. That's their pattern. How many times do we see Sarah call the law? That's their fact. Sarah told him. I didn't know, I think she said, I didn't know something like this could happen. I've never done it before. And Detective Lowen said, well, what did you expect that was going to happen? And I've got a daughter that she, uh, she was about 18 or 19, and she got, she got a grandmother's hand-me-down pickup truck. It was an older truck, but uh, she didn't have it long, and you know she was gassing it up, but she didn't put any oil in it. And eventually, it, it parked them up. And you don't know what you don't know. I hadn't done a good job of explaining, hey, you got to put oil in it, too. Sarah Boone didn't know that he could die in there. It's an old beat up canvas suitcase that she left a gap in. And as naive as that sounds, as naive as that sounds, she didn't appreciate the danger. I mean, is that the way you want to kill somebody? Is that the way you're going to do it? She had Lucas to take care of. Am I going to go to prison doing it like this? No attempt to hide. I think the evidence is clear. That's how this happened. I don't want to blame the point. I do want to show you. Just quickly show you the end of Sarah Boone got stabbed. Well, think about that. Stabbed with a steak knife in the left. And she stayed with him. She stayed with him. Poked between the eyes with a curtain rod. Salt in the eye. And who does that?
The law empowers an individual to defend their life and safety when faced with a threat and to prevent an attack. That's what Sarah Boone did. That's what Sarah Boone did. I think it's important to understand Sarah had to be the parent a lot of times. It was her place. She had that $1,000 a month from the uh, divorce settlement coming in. She had the car. She had the phone. She had the keys. She had to be the parent in a lot of ways. <coughs> I want to talk a little bit about Dr. Harper. If you remember, you know, Dr. Harper is from Okaloosa County, which is up, up in the Panhandle, of course, you know, we're from. And he, she's the doctor that treated Sarah from early on. Remember, this happened in 2020, I think. I think she first treated or first saw Sarah Boone shortly thereafter. You know, the, over the Four and a half years, saw her nine times and did, did all the testing for post-traumatic stress. Of course, she has the experience from the veterans, and she's testified that she's now just traveling around the state, testifying as a forensic psychologist. But you know, she she talked about how important it is was to, to develop trust with the patient over a course of time. It's just going to take time when you have somebody suffering that kind of trauma and that kind of damaged psyche. It's going to take some time to get to get them where they can trust you and really tell you and talk to you and tell you what's going on with them. And she talked about you know that Sarah uses her words for power. I think her testimony, I don't think, but I think I think the evidence supports that her testimony was credible. Objection. The evidence supports that her testimony was Objection credible. Is sustained. I, I can't give my first name. The evidence, the evidence supports that her testimony was credible because of the time that she spent, because of the number of tests that she did, that she diagnosed her with post-traumatic stress disorder, alcohol use disorder. Um, Think of anxiety disorder and battered spouse syndrome. So Dr. Warner confirmed that. And you know, Dr. Michael Brandon, the first witness, he was brought in as a subject matter expert. So he hadn't treated Sarah. He was just testifying about the condition. He'd been doing it a long time. He was an expert at it. And that's to advise you to try to understand what's going on. And as crazy as it sounds, in this syndrome, they, they, they try to protect the abuser. They're in love with them. They try to protect them. I don't know if you remember that there was a time where um, Sarah Boone had a conversation with one of the neighbors, and they were talking about something, and she said, did you hear anything yet last night? Remember, she said, shh. It's okay. Both George and Sarah lied to the police. They lied to medical people. I don't know if it's pain, but it just comes with the syndrome. 
that you stay trapped in it. I think another big, big, if you'll think about this. When Sarah gets beaten by George, she calls the police. When Sarah gets beaten by George, she calls the police. And a lot of times she just wants him out. <clears throat> just get him out. Get him going. She doesn't want him to get in trouble. She just wants him out. There never was a report of George calling the police on Sarah. She wasn't physically abusing it. The state is trying to present evidence. Is she emotionally uh, abusing? Sustained. <coughs> Stricken. Members of the jury will pay no attention to that comment. Give it no uh, weight whatsoever. I believe the evidence that's been presented by the state is an attempt to show that Sarah mentally or emotionally abused George Toy. Again, she's not charged with that. She's not perfect. Some of that was her trauma. In Sarah's situation, you do become numb and hardened, I think, over time. That's a coping mechanism. It's a day-to-day -day thing, some good days, some, you know. But the homicide detectives, I, I know if you saw that too, our video, at some point during the our video, they started talking about some of the violence. And they go, we know. We know. They had already checked with neighbors or whoever. They knew. The neighbors knew. The police officers knew who responded. As far as his family knew. They all knew about the abuse. Dr. Harper testified that abused women act differently when they perceive a threat. I think Sarah Boone was loyal to a fault to George, <coughs> even for all the abuse. Judge, I, I want to make a comment about a couple of things that were said by the prosecutor in the opening statement. You may proceed. Okay. Prosecutor in opening statement, when he was talking about George Torres passing away, he started talking about Sarah Boone, and his quote, quote was, because I wrote it down, George, in Sarah Boone's mind, George Torres deserved it. George Torres deserved it. That's the position they're taking. He deserved to die. She loved the man. She wasn't trying to kill him. He also commented about. Yes. yes. The prosecutor said in opening about the violence, the violent episodes. It's a bunch of violent nonsense, was his statement to you, an opening statement. All this year, the photographs, is a bunch of violent nonsense. You'll have to make your mind up for the next day. <coughs> there were a couple of exhibits that I introduced late, and they were no contact provisions, where there had been a court order from a judge, not only a verbal order, but it was reduced to writing. So there was a court order for George Torres not to have any contact with Sarah. Okay. Court system got involved. They had no contact with George Torres. Now, I need to talk a little bit about, about, about that. And they talked about coercion, coercive control, power and control, power and control. We know about his abuse. We know he destroyed the home, the TV, 
We know about his jealousy. You know, some of the things he said to her. We know about how he treated her dogs. Nicely when he was sober, but at times abused the dogs or threatened to do so. If you think about power and control, when you're controlling a person, and I think she testified that he kind of smothered her always around her. Part of his fear was her realizing that she had enough and to leave him for good. That she would get the strength over time if she had enough time away from him. Well, she wasn't in control of it and he wasn't in control of it. Enough time away she would come to her senses and realize she could do better. Judge has been giving corners all week. I didn't stop George Torres. George Torres knew he was going to lose control. But she had a bunch of time away from him. She might move on. He was willing to violate a court order to maintain control. That's George Torres. I want to show a couple of videos. You know, I want to say something to you. Shelby show, show Andrews is going to happen. If we could demo light. Yes. Right. see him flip the switch in that instance where he lost it even though the video was going show the next one Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Can you turn it off? Can you turn it off? <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm going to finish up right here. And uh, you know, Sarah Boone, I've gotten to know. Objection. Proper argument. Sustained. Sarah Boone is like any other citizen. Equal justice under the law. She used to be treated like any other citizen. Fairly and impartially. 
based on the circumstances she was facing at the time of this tragedy. Based on the battered spouse instruction, which is a special instruction that's given when women have a heightened sense of fear and trauma that you're utilized in applying her subjective standards to the reasonable standard of what a reasonable person would do under her circumstances in using the force that she used to defend herself. I hope I haven't missed anything. I've tried my best. <clears throat> Sarah Boone fought back and survived. We ask that you do justice in this case and find her not guilty because the doubt is reasonable. I've tried to show you where the doubt was. I trust your judgment. We spent a long time picking the jury four days. We trust you. We appreciate your service and your obligation to do your duty. You have the power and authority to right this wrong. That's what we're asking you to do. And give Sarah Boone some hope for a better life and freedom. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any rebuttal? Yes, sir. You may proceed. Ladies and gentlemen, George Torres is dead because the defendant believed he deserved to be zipped shut in a suitcase so that she could make him feel how she felt when he cheated on her, when he choked her, and to hold him there as a captive audience, according to her testimony. Now he has to listen to me. Well, right out of the gate, there are credibility issues. Cheating to me means viewing pornography. Well, we saw cheating really means women. And the heated conversation on June 14th about these women in Facebook, and that is what leads to the arrest on June 15th. He's out pouring, candy crush, all the bizarre things that you see in her phone. He uses the legal system as a weapon at times. There's no denying that they are engaging in violent behavior. And it is over nonsense. It is smashing TVs. They call the police and then they're standing there looking bewildered about what to do and who to say and, and laughing and joking. Ladies and gentlemen, the courtroom is a place for justice, not a suitcase. The reason we have a jury system originally started with the idea that the king, the crown in England, shouldn't be able to go and incarcerate citizens on his whim. So it developed into a system where citizens would have to say, yes, you can take our fellow citizen. But the opposite is also true. A citizen cannot take another citizen's life because he or she feels like it. That likewise requires a jury to decide that it was objectively reasonable for a person of ordinary prudence and caution. Like Mr. Cacciatore argued earlier, battered spouse syndrome is not a license to kill. Past grievances, even being stabbed in the leg, so on and so forth, do not 
give her the license to kill. There are still laws in place about when and how this can be done in a justifiable manner. I want to talk about the most important jury instruction in this case that has not been discussed very well or thoroughly. However, the use of deadly force is not justified if you find that Sarah Boone used force to initially provoke the threatened use of force against herself. And we'll stop at that comment. The facts of the case that came from her own mouth, if she is to be believed, and we will explore thoroughly why you should disregard every bit of her testimony from court to the detectives to the 911 operator to the doctors. Her testimony, if it is to be believed, the most favorable light that she has presented of herself is that at the end of a Sunday fun day, where we're drinking, we're outside by the dartboard, we're doing puzzles, we're doing arts and crafts, and there finally comes a point in time where we're going to play hide and seek. And he says, tag, you're it. Even though she's it, she goes upstairs, hides in the shower. Eventually gets tired of being there, it's cold, so on and so forth, and she comes back downstairs. And as she comes back downstairs, she can see Mr. Torres fiddling to place himself inside the suitcase to try and hide for this game. And the lid is not closed, it's flapping. And out of jest, out of levity, undisputed according to her testimony, she comes over there and zips it shut, whether it's 100%, or enough for two fingers to get out, that is something that you decide as the jury. But there came a point in time where the fun and games was over. And Mr. Torres told her that. Babe, I can't breathe. Sarah, babe, let me out. This is all on video. We don't have to imagine this. This is all on video, 1062. At that point in time, she is using force against him that is not justified. She is the initial provocateur. She is the aggressor under the law. And what level of force is it? I can't breathe. Not let go of my hand. Not get your hands off me. I can't breathe. This is no different then two people, maybe they're buddies at the bar, similar to an example that's given by Mr. Owen, who are wrestling, and one has another one in a headlock. And there comes a point in time where the person on the receiving end of the headlock says, I, you know, that's enough. I'm tapping. George Torres was tapping. And she ignored it. And she was kind enough to tell you why. Out of anger. Which translates to hatred, ill will. Spite, just like that in jury instruction for second degree murder. She told you exactly why. She got angry. Him saying, I can't breathe, babe, was what triggered her. Not a fear of imminent harm. Those are his, her own words. That is the law. These are the two paragraphs that solve this equation without getting up on a big whiteboard in college that's 30 feet long, 15 feet high, and a ladder, and somebody's scribbling Latin words and Greek letters for months and months to solve this huge, complicated equation. The equation is solved in two paragraphs. She is the initial aggressor. He is saying, I can't breathe. It is no different than a naked chokehold that she does not let go of. And she told you it's because I want him to listen to me. This is my bully pulpit pulpit. This is how he made me feel in the past. She doesn't describe it as teaching him a lesson, but that's exactly what she says. I want him to feel like I felt in the past. I want to tell him things. Ladies and gentlemen, we can play semantical games, but that is teaching him a lesson. Therefore, we have to look at the other two paragraphs. Because right now, plain as day, the use of deadly force is not justified if you find that Sarah Boone used force to initially provoke the threatened use of force against herself. And 
And what force are we talking about? Well, the threat of force that she tells you she was facing was him fighting for survival. Him sticking his fingers out of the suitcase. Him sticking his hand out. That is the threat of force coupled with, I'm going to end you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, she is the initial provocateur. She is the one using deadly force against him. If I have somebody in a rear naked chokehold, they are entitled to use deadly force against me to break that chokehold, at least until we're separated. He had every right to say what he said. He had every right to exist and stick his hand out and try and survive to breathe another day. However, the use of force is not justified if you find that Sarah Boone used the force to initially provoke the threatened use of force against herself, unless she does one of two things. And she did neither. Not even close. The threat of force asserted towards the defendant was so great that she reasonably believed that she was in imminent danger of death or great bodily harm. All right, let's give her absolutely every benefit of the doubt, which you should. This is a criminal prosecution. The state of Florida has alleged she committed murder. You need to do everything you can to look for reasonable doubt. But a reasonable doubt is not an imaginary doubt, forced doubt, speculative doubt. So accepting, accepting that all of their past history, accepting the doctor's testimony and the limitations on what they reviewed compared to what we reviewed. We did a much more thorough review of the relationship than any of the doctors did in this case. So let's give her that first clause. Because of their past relationship with George now fighting for his right to exist and saying that he will end her if he gets out, we'll give her that. But just like Mr. Cacciatore mentioned earlier, lawyers' words mean things to us, and they mean things to everybody, but really to us. Or an and. There's an and, had exhausted every reasonable means to escape the danger other than using deadly force on George Torres. She did not use every reasonable means to escape the danger that now, after provoking him, that he was presenting to her according to her. She didn't pick up her cell phone and start walking. Call 911. She didn't do anything other than, if you believe that is why she called Brian Boone, made a phone call to Brian Boone, and unfortunately, because of past history, he just ignored her drunken phone call. She did not exhaust every reasonable means to escape this danger that she created. She started it. She created this. Other than using the deadly force on George Torres. Now, this is a weird situation. This is not a rear naked chokehold. This is a suitcase, or as Mr. Cacciatore said, a box, or actually more aptly described it as a coffin. And when you secure somebody into a box or a coffin, you can still exert that deadly force on them from a distance. I'll give you a quick example from a couple of movies that I loved. In 1977 in May, a movie came out called Star Wars. They eventually called it episode four. In the first scene, there is this large imposing figure that wears black armor. He is a government agent and he is looking for some stolen classified documents. He picks a man up who he believes is responsible for this treachery and breaks his neck and chokes him to death when he doesn't tell him where the, the plans are. We all understand that. That is direct force we all understand. But what we need to understand is the force she's exerting from the couch. And then when she goes up to bed, she is still exerting that force on him. She set these implementations into motion and did not stop. So later in this movie that came out in 1977, Another co-employee of this dark, imposing figure, Vader, insults his religion. He does not go to HR. He takes matters into his own hands, 
and chokes this person from a distance. Ironically, while we're talking about force, it's the force. And then in the subsequent movie, he's like doing it from his office. He's, he's killing his incompetent employees on different ships. Force, deadly force can be exerted from a distance in this situation. So whether she's on the couch or whether she turns in for bed, she is still using that deadly force on him. She has not exhausted every reasonable means to escape this danger. Do something. You started this. You put him in the position where he cannot breathe. She's required by law to do something about it. Not something, everything. There was no efforts in this case. None. Or, in good faith, Sarah Boone withdrew from physical contact with Jorge to George Torres and clearly indicated to George Torres that she wanted to withdraw and stop the use of deadly force. But Jorge, George, just reads Jorge. George Torres continued or resumed the threatened use of force. That did not happen. She never withdrew from physical contact. She is still like Vader, choking him from the couch, choking him from bed. She never withdrew that force. Physical contact includes any restraint on George Torres' movement. She never indicated that she wanted to withdraw. Sarah, babe, I can't breathe. All right, if I let you out, are you gonna come out peacefully? Since I started this, I'm the one that made you not be able to breathe. That didn't happen. So ladies and gentlemen, this entire analysis about deadly force starts and ends there. She was the provocateur. These are her obligations when she starts it. She put him in fear of death. He is literally telling her, I cannot breathe. A couple other things about the law. Second degree murder does not require a proof of intent to kill. Argument was made repeatedly that she didn't intend to kill him. That has never been the state's suggestion because why would we suggest we prove something that we don't have to? It's not her subjective belief. Well, Sarah Boone doesn't believe that this suitcase can kill him, even though he's repeatedly said, I can't breathe. It's a person of ordinary judgment who would know is reasonably certain to kill or do serious bodily injury to another. A person of ordinary judgment who hears, I can't breathe, babe, Sarah, and his voice gets weaker nine minutes later. You're on notice. This is statutory notice. Done from ill will, hatred, spite, or evil intent. Her words speak for herself. This was not out of fear. This was out of hatred and anger. Born out of all those horrible things that have been done to her and done to him, I understand, it. we're not going to belabor the past, is of such neighbor that the act itself indicates a difference in human life. I don't care that you're saying you can't breathe. Fuck you. That's my name. Don't wear it out. Fuck you. It's second degree murder. We do not have to prove the intent to kill. We have to, she intended the act. She intended the act of zipping him shut. She continued to in, intend that act when he said, I can't breathe. That act resulted in his death. That's a manslaughter, but then when you add in the hatred, ill will, spite, and the depraved mind, that's what makes it second degree murder. And that two minute video is the textbook definition of depraved mind as we define it here in Florida. Voluntary intoxication is not a defense. You cannot feel sorry for her because they had two 1.5 liter bottles of wine and then some from the leftovers from the day before. And quite frankly, she's blackout drunk. She's blackout drunk. She doesn't remember making the videos. She turns her phone over right to the deputy the next day because she doesn't know what's on it. She doesn't remember doing it. Another thing that we just haven't talked about much is her story. 
She can't be up in the shower hiding and taking a picture at 11.03 p.m., nine minutes before the video. That portion of her story just doesn't add up. And what it shows is it's more like 20 minutes instead of 11 or 12 minutes that we know he's trapped in what turns out to be his coffin. Let's talk about her testimony at trial. And we'll talk about all the problems. A lot of her issues predated her relationship with Mr. Torres. So it's not attributable to the trauma from Mr. Torres with all the luggage she brought into the relationship. And listen to the way she talks. It's not splitting the bills. It's helping without argument. It's not cleaning up and doing Sunday chores. It's, it's cleaning up so we can relax. It's a reward. She talks about him like he's a child. I need to lead him to the next activity from one to the other. And then you saw the videos, and I'm not going to belabor it, but that we showed in rebuttal, but the relationship and the power dynamics speak for itself. He was treated like the third dog. And it might very well have been a dog that bit and was violent, but he was treated like a dog. Why are you leaning against my door? Get out of here. Go downstairs. You're worthless. You're garbage. They showed the part of the video uh, where he slaps the phone, but that's after five or six minutes of being berated and dehumanized uh, in a way that nobody should be treated. He just wanted to get in bed and, and, and lay down next to his fiance. Instead, get away from the side of my door, you useless dog. I thought it might be a good point in time to listen to the music. You know, when does, when does Mr. Torres get to decide what to do? I mean, she, she paints this picture that he goes off and does all these things on his own, um, goes and buys wine when he's not supposed to, does all these things when he's not supposed to, but when does he get to do what he wants? Suitcase downstairs for a week so they can donate it. What was in their lives that was preventing them from getting that suitcase to the Goodwill or whatever? Neither one of them worked. What's going on? Lucas is over there on Mondays and Tuesdays. The story about the suitcase having already been down there is quite suspect, and we will get into that more. But again, it's not we went on a trip together, we had a great time. It's, I quote unquote, I recently took him on a trip. Then it comes down to the moment of truth, which we've already gone over. And it's just quite frankly inconsistent because she doesn't, there's no explanation for the picture. Her explanation at trial when I brought it up to her was, I just don't remember. I don't remember this period in time from the picture at 11.03 to, to, when I was supposed to be coming down the stairs. There's a major glitch in her matrix. She shakes the suitcase, please stop doing this to me. And then his hand gets out. Now she's the point in time when she gets angry and doesn't do what the law requires after basically choking him with his coffin. Beats him into submission with the bat and turns it back over. For the first time ever at trial, she says, I'm going to fucking end you is what he said. She never told that to even her doctors. We've heard the arguments why she didn't tell the truth to the police and all, all that. And there's a lot of truth into the argument that was made. There's a lot of truth. When the argument is made that she didn't understand self-defense, what that means, what it comes across as, she makes the story change as she learns about it. When we apply the jury instructions to her statement, all six of them apply against her. <laughs> Won't belabor this since it was discussed earlier. But did the witness have an opportunity to see and know the things about which the witness testified? Even at trial, she admitted that she was intoxicated for the first time. She went back and forth with the police about whether or not she was intoxicated and her standard of drunkenness and whatnot. But she was so intoxicated that she still felt the effects of it at one in the afternoon the following day. The medical examiner told you that 
alcohol dissipates in the average person. Everybody's different. Tolerance, all sorts of things come into play. But on average, 0.015 um, grams per deciliter will dissipate every hour. So you can do the math. 0.015 times 14 puts her at two and a half times the legal limit. For those reasons alone, you should not believe anything she told you. You should not believe anything she told the police. You should not believe anything she told the doctors. She was at two and a half times the legal limit. She has a gap in her memory that's unexplained when I brought up the photograph at 1103. You can't have it both ways. I don't remember 1103 to 1112, but I was upstairs in the shower hiding. Does the witness seem to have an accurate memory? Well, this ties into what we're talking about. But again, there's a glitch in the matrix, 1103 to 1112. Her memory is not accurate. By her own admission, I don't remember. She tells the police when they show her the video, I don't remember that happening. Was the witness honest and straightforward in answering the attorney's questions? I submit when we got off script, and by we, I mean both, with both attorneys, she wasn't as honest and straightforward um, as when it was a very directed and smooth um, examination. I came out of the gate with something that um, was off script. Tell me about Pamela Erickson. Tell me about Christine. Tell me about Crystal. Because she's the one that said cheating to her meant pornography. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you know, she knew exactly who those people were and that she believed that he was cheating on them with her. And apparently she is, too, with some guy named Ben. That When I describe this as a violent, nonsensical relationship, that's exactly what it is. It's not to downplay the violence. She got stabbed. She had minor surgery. It got infected. She, she those injuries are real. But they just don't apply in this case. They just don't apply when you use that self-defense instruction when she's the aggressor, if it's to be believed. Judge, I get I proceed. Objections overruled. Let me say it loud and clear. Bad spell syndrome does not have any effect on this case. It has no relationship to this case because she is the aggressor. She zipped him shut in the suitcase after he said, I couldn't breathe, she wouldn't let him out. Therefore, all of the instructions above that paragraph of however do not apply. They do not apply. Now, turning back to what I was saying, did the witness have some interest in how the case would be decided? Well, of course. Three out of four panels that y'all came from indicated to the judge fear of punishment was more important than the fear of public speaking. It speaks for itself. She has an interest in the outcome of the case. Now let's talk about does her testimony agree with the other evidence in the case? You do not have to accept this story. Let's pretend as you should, because all six of these things, we haven't even gotten to the inconsistent statements. Let's pretend her testimony doesn't exist and you just have to look at the circumstances. The testimony from the defendant is George Torres's head is here. You can stand if you need. You've been sitting a long time, too. His head is here. His butt is kind of down here. His feet are here. And his hands and his knees are up here. He's in the fetal position, if we remember right. The hematoma on his head is on the left side. The bruises, the deep bruises on his back are on his left side. That's, you hear that? That's solid. You don't have to accept that she put those marks on him when he was in there. The evidence doesn't support it. You can conclude she used this bat when he was outside the suitcase. 
You don't have to believe her when she said they were playing hide and seek. You don't have to believe her because she doesn't know the rules. She came downstairs, saw what she had done, and had all the opportunity in the world to clean up whatever mess may have been at the bottom of the stairs. But ladies and gentlemen, physics doesn't lie. She can't expect you to believe her testimony about the loud boom being the day before compared to her two neighbors who weren't drinking, who have no interest in the outcome of the case, who suffer from none of the infirmities of her testimony. She suffers from all six infirmities. When her neighbors say there was a loud boom that night, there was a loud boom that night. Did it shake the wall they shared in common? It shook the wall that they shared in common. Did she have any injuries consistent with being dragged up and down the stairs the night before? No, you saw the pictures the CSI took. You don't have to accept her story about hide and seek. Something made that loud boom. It takes energy to make a loud boom. Energy that could very well be in the form of somebody going down some of the stairs, all the stairs, in the suitcase, out of the suitcase. But that's what the evidence supports is there was a loud boom that shook the walls and interrupted a FaceTime conversation that was so loud that the girlfriend on the other end heard it. Something loud happened. And then there was silence, according to the witnesses. And they can argue that Juan Torres' testimony was great for them. It's great for the state. She was screaming at him already at 7.30 p.m. She was already on her bully pulpit. And we know she doesn't need to put him into the coffin to get on her bully pulpit. There's video after video of her on her bully pulpit telling him how it's going to be, how you're going to live your life. Go take a walk. Do this. Do that. You don't have to accept anything she said. It's inconsistent that he received the hematoma to his head, his bloody mouth. How is his mouth getting bloodied inside the suitcase? That's protected from her and her bat. But that suitcase, a hundred pound drunk woman is not beating through the wood of that suitcase or whatever it is that's making that noise when it's thumped. Ladies and gentlemen, those injuries happen outside of the suitcase. Ladies and gentlemen, somebody or something went down those stairs. She has no injuries consistent with going down the stairs. He does. He has blunt force trauma all over him. You don't have to buy her story, and you shouldn't. The inconsistencies, I'm not going to belabor it. Your dinner is waiting in back. Let's just briefly talk about the experts, and we'll move on to the end. Dr. Brandon was absolutely fantastic. He explained everything that you all needed to know about battered spouse syndrome. And this isn't about whether one of them or both of them had battered spouse, because at the end of the day, she's the initial aggressor and she had the duty to do the things that the law requires. But it does call into question the credibility of the past power dynamics of their relationship. Those videos speak for themselves. The officer in, in the last video asks him, dude, you're a guy. Why don't, you, why don't you do something about this woman, your wifey, who you don't want to rat on for beating you? He's like, man, I'm not a beefcake. I'm not going to rat her out. There's countless examples if you apply Dr. Brandon's testimony to Juan Torres that really shows you the power dynamics of the relationship. He was her violent pet. Dr. Harper, I don't find much quarrel with what she says about battered spouse syndrome, and nobody should. I mean, she's the expert, but she's not Ms. Boone's treating physician. She's not her treating psychologist. The way it was described in argument, and I believe from Dr. Brandon's testimony, was she's supposed to be a forensic detective. Get to the bottom of this. She's going to come in here at trial and tell you her opinion you should rely upon. With nine visits, she never asked the defendant what it is the victim said that put you in imminent fear of death or great bodily harm. 
That's the crux of the matter, Doc. You're never going to ask her what it is he said or did for this grand jury instruction about threat of force or use of force. It's remarkable. And, you know, she didn't review everything that was presented to you. At the end of the day, it's your opinion that matters about this relationship. And again, we agree with Dr. Werner. It doesn't matter. She had the duty to retreat. She had the duty to take the chokehold off. And if it was too dangerous for her to directly take the chokehold off, she had the duty to do something else, everything in her power to stop him from dying because she started it. She set it in motion. She used the force grip on him from a distance, the couch and from bed. She, it was her obligation to stop. She didn't. But Dr. Werner, she was called by the state of Florida after having evaluated and listened to the defendant give a similar story and concluded that its spouse doesn't apply. So she was never asked to delve any deeper into it. Given the information that she did have, the limited information, she agrees. Yes, Ms. Boone has battered spouse syndrome, but it doesn't apply to the case because she was the aggressor and she did not fulfill her obligations. And really just your gut common sense. Go back to jury selection. In jury selection, there was examples about bullies day after day doing something to somebody. And somebody raised their hand and said, don't they have to do something that day? Don't they have to do something that day? And he didn't. After he was put in fear of death and told her he can't breathe, the imminent threat of great bodily harm and death she is describing to you is him fighting for his life to escape. She did not fulfill her obligations. There's details that matter. And again, not to belabor it. I mean, the evidence in the, the body worn camera and, and the 911 calls, it's not offered to prove the truth of the matter of as who stated what. Who knows what happened between these two? You see them with the police. Can't believe anything they're saying. It's not offered to prove that she's a bad person. It's not offered to prove that Mr. Torres is a bad person. It's simply offered to call in question the reliability and credibility of what she said about the past. That's all that it's there for. But there are some nuggets and some Easter eggs. There was an argument made during closings that um, Mr. Torres knows not to do anything when being videotaped. Bizarrely, shortly thereafter, they showed a very edited clip of him attacking her and slapping the phone out of her hand. He knows he was being videotaped and there was another video like it too. So to make the argument that he doesn't, he doesn't do anything, he's a good boy when he's being videotaped, it's, it's belied by their own argument. They showed the, one of the videos. Learned helplessness. She seemed to control everything. I mean, his birth certificate, it gets torn up when she, he doesn't comply with her wishes. Um, you'll see the rest of the text messages if you choose to delve into them. But I would suggest you don't have to, given the, the jury instruction about aggressor. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been a long two weeks and you are making a very, very important decision for Ms. Boone and a very, very important decision for Mr. Torres and the state of Florida and his family. He's dead. She killed him. She's admitting she killed him to have this affirmative defense of I was justified. It was not justified under our law. She does not get to decide that she has a license to kill because of her past grievances. The law requires her to stop using the force that she started applying to him. And she didn't. She didn't withdraw. She didn't tell him he was withdrawing. She didn't use every means available to try and stop this from happening. She didn't. And you know what was in her heart. She tells you it's hatred, ill will, spite, and venom. This is not a self-defense case under the law. Go back and follow the law. You cannot feel sorry for her. You cannot feel sorry for him. You cannot feel angry at her. You cannot feel angry at him. It's maddening to see their relationship. It is maddening. Nobody would want this life for yourselves or your children. 
It is violent nonsense, but it does not affect what she did and what her duties were under the law that night. She wanted to punish him. She did. And then she left him there. And she had an obligation. If you even believe her story about the imminent threat for him fighting for his life, she had an obligation to do something about it and not just go upstairs and let him suffocate. Thank you. Thank you both. Members of the jury, I have some additional instructions to read to you. If you would be so kind to turn to page 21 of 22. Instruction 3.12, verdict. You may find the defendant guilty as charged or guilty of such lesser included crime as the evidence may justify or not guilty. If you return a verdict of guilty, it should be for the highest offense on the verdict form that has been proved, proven, excuse me, beyond a reasonable doubt. If you find that no offense has been proven beyond a reasonable doubt, then, of course, your verdict must be not guilty. The verdict must be unanimous. That is, all of you must agree to the same verdict. Only one verdict may be returned as to the crime charged. The verdict must be in writing, and for your convenience, the necessary verdict form has been prepared for you. It is as follows. If you're looking for it, you don't have it. I do. <laughs> That's why we only have one. The verdict form reads, in the Circuit Court of the Ninth Judicial Circuit in and for Orange County, Florida, case number 48-2020-CF-002603-0, State of Florida Plaintiff versus Sarah Boone Defendant, verdict. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of murder in the second degree as charged in the information. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of the lesser included offense of manslaughter. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of the lesser included offense of culpable negligence. We, the jury, find the defendant not guilty. So say we all, dated at Orlando, Orange County, Florida, on this blank day of blank, 2024, signed, four person. Final instruction, members of the jury, page 22. Instruction 3.13, submitting case to jury. In just a few moments, you will be taken to the jury room by the court deputy. The first thing you should do is choose a four person who will preside over your deliberations. The four person should see to it that your discussions are carried on in an organized way and that everyone has a fair chance to be heard. It is, the four it is also the four person's job to sign and date the verdict form when all of you have agreed on a verdict and to bring the verdict form back to the courtroom when you return. During deliberations, jurors must communicate about the case only with one another and only when all jurors are present in the jury room. If a juror goes to the restroom, the deliberations should stop until the juror returns. You are not to communicate with any person outside the jury about this case. Until you have reached a verdict, you must not talk about this case in person or through the telephone, writing, or electronic communication, such as an email or any other means. Do not contact anyone to assist you during deliberations. These communications rules apply until I discharge you at the end of the case. If you become aware of any violation of these instructions or any other instruction I have given in this case, you must tell me by giving a note to the court deputy. Many of you may have cell phones, tablets, laptops, or other electronic devices here in the courtroom. The rules do not allow you to bring your phones or any of those types of electronic devices into the jury room. Kindly leave those devices on your seats where they will be guarded by the court deputy while you deliberate. If you need to communicate with me, send a note through the court deputy. If you have voted, do not disclose the actual vote in the note. If you have a question, I will talk with the attorneys before I answer, so it may take some time. You may continue your deliberations while you wait for my answer. I will answer any questions, if I can, in writing or orally here in open court. During the trial, items were received into evidence as exhibit, exhibits. Excuse me. You may examine whatever exhibits you think will help you in your deliberations. All exhibit with the exception, all exhibits, excuse me, with the exception of exhibit 10, which purports to be a wooden baseball bat, will be sent into the jury room 
with you when you begin to deliberate. If you wish to see Exhibit 10, which purports to be a wooden baseball bat, please request that in writing. In closing, let me remind you that it is important that you follow the law spelled out in these instructions in deciding your verdict. There are no other laws that apply in this case. Even if you do not like the laws that must be applied, you must use them. For more than two centuries, we have lived by the Constitution and the law. No juror has the right to violate the rules we all share. The parties approach. Members of our jury, I want to take a moment and thank you for your time, your service, and your participation in this very important process. As I said to you last week, be it Monday or Tuesday, maybe even on Wednesday, without your sacrifice and your service, the wheels of justice would simply come to a screeching halt. And on behalf of myself, the state, the defense, and Ms. Boone, we thank you for that sacrifice. With that, jurors wearing badge 295-9569-515-130, Two four nine and four four eight and one one zero. You successfully served as our alternate jurors in this trial. I wish I could give you more than my thanks and a hot meal that's waiting for you, but I do thank you for your service and your sacrifice. Courtroom deputy is going to take you out at this time so you can collect your meal, and I'll meet you back there momentarily to give you your jury certificates. Thank you for your service. The rest, of y'all. If I didn't call your badge, you need to hang out. Y'all may be seated. For you six, you are the jury that will be deliberating in this case. I thank you again for your time and your service. The exhibits will be brought back to you momentarily, um, and a meal is waiting for you. Uh, we will work till approximately 10 o'clock tonight if you do not render a verdict before then. Uh, and I thank you again for your time and your service. I'm going to ask the courtroom deputy to go ahead and take you back now to the deliberation room. <laughs> You can bring your phone with you. There's a basket that the deputy will take and collect for you. Thank you. You all can be seated. Thank you very much. Did you intend for jurors to take the notes into the deliberation room? Yes. Okay. I, I would object to that on the ground that it allows one juror to potentially assert that their notes are better than others as opposed to just relying on them. Any response, State? That's not the there's a verdict form that there's an instruction that I read specifically on that, sir, that no one juror's notes should trump another juror's notes or their memory. So your objections. Um, Mr. J and or Mr. Cacciatore, do you have the clean laptop for the review by the defense? And while we're putting and while we're putting that together, can both the state and the defense review all exhibits that were entered into evidence and confirm they are what they purport to be? so that all exhibits that were entered with the exception of exhibit 10, the bat would be sent back to our jury. Yes, please. I'm going to go speak to the alternates and I'll return to the Thank you. Thank you. back on the record 2020 CF 2603 state of Florida versus Sarah Boone state appearances for the record 
Defense. James Edwards from this bid. I have the parties had the opportunity to review and inspect all the evidence to be sent back with the jury. The defense has as best as I could. Okay. Yeah, I didn't keep a tally, so uh, I trust the clerks. Madam Clerk is the best, so I have no doubts that everything is included. State had the opportunity to review it. Okay, all right. Uh, and with regard to the laptop, has it been inspected? Yes. Yes. All right. Okay. So we'll send the exhibits back, with the exception of Exhibit Ten, the bat and the clean laptop, to our jury. Um, Miss Boone, I've got a couple of questions to go over with you again, ma'am. If I could, ma'am, you were sworn previously this morning. You've been present throughout the entire trial, starting last week through today. You've been seated next to your lawyers at counsel's table. You've had the opportunity to observe the opening statements, the direct examination and cross-examination of all the state's witnesses, the direct examination and cross-examination of all the defense witnesses, and the opening or the closing statements as well that were presented by both sides. You've also had the opportunity to observe all of the exhibits that were presented as evidence in this case. Are you satisfied with your lawyers up and until this point? Absolutely. And are you in agreement with the strategy utilized in your defense? Yes. The last issue that I need to address is the state's request for in-camera hearing regarding financial arrangements between defendant and defense team. State, what is your concern? It's a very expensive defense and she's indigent and there are bar rules that limit the ways that things can be done. I don't know what's going on. It's none of my business unless it's raised in 3850. So if there's an in-camera proceeding, um, I would ask to be sealed and won't be any need to get into it unless there's a 3850 claim that's in conflict of interest. Is there anything other than concern or speculation that you have? Um, just things in passing that have been said and, and observed. It's a very expensive uh, defense. Um, that's my concern. I don't want her to be able to raise any arguments that, well, I would have pled if I had a conflict-free lawyer who did not want to go to trial for his or her own reasons. Okay. Mr. Owens, is there anything of concern that I need to be aware of in camera? No, sir. Mr. Henderson, same question to you, sir. Is there anything of concern that I need to be aware of in camera or otherwise? No, sir. Mr. Beck, same question for you. Is there anything of concern that I need to be aware of, be it here or in camera? No, sir. Okay. All right. Judge, if you need to inquire from my client about whether or not she wanted to enter a plea or whether she wanted to go to trial, but, you know, we, we made it clear that it was her decision, not my decision to go to trial because I'm trying to gain some publicity or money or book deal or whatever. But that was her decision. There was, there was some strong um, conversations we had about what was on the table. And Ms. Boone, as she has a right to, wanted to try. Mr. Henderson and Mr. Beck, would you agree with Mr. Owen's recitation as to none of the financial issues being book deals or anything on the table at this point in time. Judge, yes, because I definitely don't know about it. Okay. Mr. Beck, anything to add, sir? On the honor that I believe this is attorney client privilege information, but there are no concerns about I, I colloquied Mr. Owens, your client, before we picked a jury as to the offer in this case and whether or not she was ready and wanted to proceed to trial. And she had affirmed at that point in time, that's what she wanted to do. So I, I see no reason to inquire of that further. State, is there anything else we need to address? Yeah. Defense, anything else? Yes. All right, please give your cell phone numbers to Madam Clerk. We will be on verdict watch. Um, and I thank you all for your hard work in this case. We're off the record. Second. We are on the record in case number 2020 CF 2603, State of Florida versus Sarah Boone. State, let me get your parents for the record. Chief Kester on behalf of the state, William Jacobs State. Defense. James Owens for Ms. Boone. Kevin Boone. Mr. Henderson is not going to be here for the Okay, all right. Uh, Ms. Boone is seated at council's table, wearing the same clothing from this morning. Uh, yes, Mr. Beck. Judge, uh, They've got her 
in the chains and uh, they got her in the ankle uh, handcuffs so she can't she can't go anywhere. I'm just asking we would like to rise during the uh, jury coming in. I'm asking if there's any way we can take off the, the handcuffs and the, uh, the waist chain so that the jury wouldn't see it in case there's something wrong with the verdict form or you know there's an issue which sometimes happens but that's my position okay i've been advised by the sheriff that during the reading of the verdict due to miss boone's status in an inmate their leg irons and the cuffs are, are to be attached well, she's going to stay seated that's fine mr beck's going to stay seated i would ask for this all remains seated and would you mind everybody in the gallery um, that there should be no emotional I, I was just about to address that sir thank you very much all right members of the jury my understanding or members of the gallery good evening my understanding is that the jury in this matter has reached a verdict i don't know what it's going to be until it's read if you are unable to contain yourself emotionally and you're going to react in any way be it in joy or in sadness i'm going to ask you politely to excuse yourself at this time there cannot be any emotional outbursts when the verdict is read. Does everybody understand that? I see everybody nodding their heads. Okay. State, are we ready to bring in our jury? Yes, sir. Defense, are we ready to bring in our jury? Yes, sir. All right. Let's go ahead and bring in our jury. Everyone will remain seated. State, do you recognize our jury? Yes, Your Honor. Defense, do you recognize our jury? Yes, sir. All right. Members of the jury, you may be seated. Thank you. Members of our jury, good evening. I understand that you've come to a verdict in this case. Yes. If you could please hand the verdict form to the deputy, please. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. Madam Clerk, if you could please publish the verdict. In the circuit court of the 9th Judicial Circuit, Adams in Orange County, Florida, case number 2020 CF 2603, the state of Florida versus Sarah Moon. Verdict. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of murder in the second degree as charged in the information. So, St. Bill, dated at Orlando, Orange County, Florida, on this 25th day of October 2024, the form has been signed by the court. Madam Clerk, please poll our jury. Juror seat number one, is this your true and correct verdict? Yes, it is. Juror seat number two, is this your true and correct verdict? Yes, it is. Juror seat number three, is this your true yes, and correct is. verdict? Juror seat number four, is this your true and correct verdict? Yes. Juror seat number five, is this your true and correct verdict? Yes. Juror seat number six, is this your true and correct verdict? Yes, ma'am. Members of our jury, again, I want to thank you for your time, your sacrifice, and your attention in this matter. I know that we spent almost two weeks together and it was not taken lightly. And I really appreciate the time and the effort and the sacrifice that you put into this case. I want to advise you now of your final instruction. Members, ladies and gentlemen, I wish to thank you for your time and your consideration in this case. I also wish to advise you of some very special privileges enjoyed by jurors. No juror can ever be required to talk about the discussions that occurred in the jury room except by court order. For many centuries, our society has relied upon juries for consideration of difficult cases. We have recognized for hundreds of years that a jury's deliberations, discussions, and votes should remain their private affair as long as they wish it. Therefore, the law gives you a unique privilege not to speak about the jury's work. Although you are at liberty to speak to anyone about your deliberations, you are also at liberty to refuse to speak to anyone. A request to discuss either your verdict or your deliberations may come from those who are simply curious, from those who might seek to find fault with you, from the media, from the attorneys, or elsewhere. It will be up to you to decide whether to preserve your privacy as a juror. With that, members of the jury, again, I thank you for your service. I'm gonna ask you to return to the deliberation room. I'll be back there shortly with your jury certificates, and thank you. Go 
Ms. Boone, the jury has spoken in this matter and has found you guilty of murder in the second degree. The court adjudicates you guilty of murder in the second degree. As this is your first felony conviction, you are entitled to a pre-sentencing investigation by the Department of Corrections. Mr. Owens, are you seeking that in this case? Yes. Okay. State, I will order the Department of Corrections to prepare the pre-sentencing investigation. State, for the purposes of sentencing, do you anticipate eliciting any testimony from be it the victims, victim's family? Two or three victim impact statements, sir. Okay. Mr. Owens, do you plan on presenting any evidence during the course of the sentencing hearing, sir? Um, probably some testimony from Dr. Harper. Okay. All right. How long do you think state that you would need? You mean timing wise or are we thinking? A uh, quantum of time, sir. Time. Yeah. Well, normally it takes about 30 days or so. I'm confirming with Anita as to availability. I just want to know from your side of the ledger, how much time? Okay. 15 minutes. How much time do you think you're going to need to produce anything from your side of the ledger, sir? Mr. Owens. I'd say 30 minutes. Okay. 30 to 45. So if we set this for an hour, that would be sufficient. Pardon me. Okay. Is that sufficient, Mr. Owens? Yes. Okay. All right. Give me a moment. Ms. Berrios is checking. Just give us a moment. We can set this matter for 1.30 in the afternoon for sentencing on December 2. State, is that acceptable? It's a Monday. I, I just have a hearing, but uh, I'm, I'll make it work. I can move it to later if necessary. Uh, I'm co on it. Okay. Defense. Yes, sir. That's Monday, December 2 at 1 30. Yes, sir. I can be here. Right. Ma'am, you've been adjudicated guilty. I now um, remand you into the custody of the Orange County Jail pending sentencing on December 2 at 1 30. State anything else we need to address? Not from the state. Defense. All right. Thank you very much. We're off the record.